If Murray had supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, Sending out good vibes. Shivers or vibrations and stuff like that. America. You know exactly who you are as you're growing up. Your father is always with you, taking you on trips into the jungle, teaching you about different plants, um, teaching you how to hunt. You don't have a real a uh, question of who you are. Okay, guys, welcome back to the Grand America Show. A little bit of an extra ep, I suppose, as we try to get back in the regular rotation. We've been kind of stuck with this midweek release for about a month now. We're trying to shake ourselves back to the weekend. Makes our lives a little bit easier when we're not trying to edit on weeknights and do all that. So we get back into the Saturday slot. Hopefully by next week, we'll be back into the Friday slot. We'll keep that regular. Of course, we'll keep throwing out some bonus eps here and there. But yeah, another little, this is kind of a bonus set because it gets us back on track. Of course, with our our friend of the show, Dave Matheson. I think he's been on five or six times now. Fantastic guy. Of course, it's it's kind of strange we haven't met him yet. Of course, we're going to meet him twice this year. We're going to, we'll meet him in Washington for the Randall Carlson contact at the cabin, Scablands, September 21 to 26. Of course, that is sold out, but there is still availability for the September 28th to October 3rd. Last I checked, there was nine spots available, but there's a bunch of people kicking tires. So if you want to get on that, of course, Dave Matheson won't be there for week two. We're going to bring in a, a sec, a, a different, um, what do you call that? Uh, guest presenter to assist Randall for week two. We don't know exactly who that's going to be yet, but we'll have that soon. And of course, we do actually have a, some extremely limited availability due to a few cancellations. We filled up all the cancellations, I think, except for one private room, which I could maybe split in. I could throw an extra mat, floor mat in there and make it a twofer or something like that. But anyway, there's room for one or two people for that Utah contact at the Canyon. Going to be a fantastic event. Of course, all that stuff, it, all that info is over at contactatthecabin.com. Time to go check that stuff out. I expect all that stuff to be sold out by the end of the month. I mean, we sold probably like 15 tickets last week for the Randall event, so... And get on that before it's too late. Yeah, we'll uh, do a little intro here to get into our chat with Dave. We got Graham Nipples Dunlop over here. How's it going, buddy? Hey, buddy. Good. I got them calmed down today. You I don't to want to excite you at all. Put some band aids over. I went over the in the chats and I'm seeing all this nipple talk, and then I'm thinking back to when you're making comments about my nipples at work. I'm like, oh boy, Jesus. Oh yeah. Now the nipples things had nothing to do with you. Okay, good. Well, that's what you say. They're trying to figure out a way to be, pick a leader. And I just said, just go biggest junk for one, and then vice is biggest nipples. Oh, that vice. I thought you meant like your vice, like. No, vice. A vice. Like vice you president. Know, like that was your vice. <laughs> 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 I misunderstood that whole thing. I, oh, you had oh. to go back further. Okay. That's well, the problem with the chats. I went back pretty far, but. Not quite far enough. Not quite far enough. America.ca slash chats. If you want to get in there, I think there's like 900 people. Of course, Discord is getting a little bit weird these days. Yeah. What, I want to ask you some questions we about what you talked about earlier. could get that anytime. I really? See. What what was going on with that? Ryan was... Uh, oh, I don't know. I think stuff. their Discord's just getting weird. They're trying to transition from gamer into like social media platform. I mean, they must Didn't be Didn't that making, already organically happen with everybody like in it, their Discord channel? I mean... They, they must be making money hand over fist. So good. And I think they're trying to get in on some of this work from home stuff and market to that crowd maybe but i don't know our discord days could be numbered for sure i mean there's definitely enough stuff in the back catalog that goes against the grain that we could kicked off any of that stuff at yeah any if, time. if other people are getting kicked off i mean i can't imagine what they're doing yeah that would be worse than us i, mean, I know i was saying there was like not that i'm saying it's 12, bad at all but it's bad in the in 12 the of the different culture, discords he's been in have disappeared really yeah holy what yeah, I don't know what Discord he's in, but <laughs> that's why the Knights it's of the good Round to know. Table. I mean, we've I, got I, a full I, backups chat server built. Yeah, this is why people need to sign up for the newsletter. Yeah, because if we ever lose our RSS feed or our social media or our chats or anything like that, 
we've got everything sort of in place to switch to our own servers at the snap of a hat. But how are we going to let you guys know? There'll be no way to let you know because that uh, the existing RSS feed will probably not be any good anymore. No, it would have to be by like Instagram or Twitter. And then who knows if, that, if you're on that. You know, that's like yeah, a newsletter the problem, is right? the last line of defense. Yeah. If we ever have to switch the chat server and all that, it's all going to go out in the newsletter. This is why you need yeah. to be signed up for the newsletter. There yeah. should be 20,000, 30,000 people signed up for that fucking newsletter. And I think there's only 700. Yeah. Well, we haven't been pushing it at all either. I mean, it's just... We've been pushing it for five years. Not really. On and off. Well, now it's important. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. Yeah. But what are these people getting their discords down for? I don't know. Like, I'm not saying ours is, like, super risky or anything, but it's definitely just sort of free speech kind of thing. Like, yeah. I, yeah, I don't know. There's not a lot. There's more mostly love in there in general, but things do get a little, you know, whenever you get into the dark path of politics, it kind of gets a little sketchy. It's tough to say. I don't know enough. I mean, I might be able to speak to it, but I don't know what, uh, I mean, it just seems like they're just clamping down on everything everywhere. So I don't see why Discord would be any different, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, what did you, uh, I got some questions about the Utah thing. So that's, you're talking about the star, Star Myths Watch. of the world, the Star yeah. Watch with Dave Matheson in two different locations, right? Yeah. And that's Ryan the one. You think that's still Ryan. happening then? Like with the borders and everything? What if things get worse? Well, we Which can't really push it back be. again. So if it, so if that's it happens, happening though, regardless. That's happening whether we're there or not, right? Yeah. That's going to happen with other people that are helping us out. With yeah, it, like the, the Snake, Snake Bros, Bros will be there. Dave, Dave will be there. Brandon Powell will Brandon be there. Powell. We'll make so it happen either way. Okay. So I mean, I'm pretty sure we could cross the border anyway now that we've got like a legit company and stuff and we're putting on something like that. I think there's a way to get through. We'll have to look into that if it gets to that. Because right now it's open for commerce. So we'll have to see what kind of hoops. I mean, we're going to, we got to go to Washington first. So yeah, we'll see. see Again, the way I see it. Well, the Washington thing is going to happen. Randall's is going to happen as well. Everything's happening. No matter what. Unless something crazy happens with states. Like people might not be able to go across the border, but they can go within state to state. Like, so there's enough Americans to make it go basically. And then if that happened, we'd just end up probably refunding the out of country people. Yeah. Yeah. Or if it was enough of a hiccup, you know, we'd, push it back to the spring or something like that. I mean, I'd rather not get into that. It would seem crazy if we had to push all that back a year for this oh, bullshit. Oh, no, I know. I know. And, and, and let's be, f- and let, let's let's be, be fair. Frank, the people want to fucking go. It's bullshit. Yeah, is what pe- it is. Everyone it's wants to go. Everyone's yeah. had enough. Of course, those Zoom calls have fired up. We did another one with Dave. We're going to do another one. We're getting the email list together for the Carlson Scablands tours. So we'll have some Zooms. And we're, oh, okay. We're cool. all ready to start getting oh, in that's touch. Cool. We started up the Matheson Zoom calls again. So uh, if you're not in on those, shoot me an email. I'll make sure you get on the email list. That's great. So in this little, we do a little intro here where we ramble. We get some listener emails involved and stuff from the chats maybe and and uh, introduce our guest and but I, I felt the last few days I felt really appreciative of the people that support alternative media, you know, the people that help us out value for value or the people that donate to whatever, no agenda or the, all the people in the union of the unwanted, like we're going to be on the ripple effect uh, coming up. We're doing a swap cast with them. And I mean, his, he did a latest show. I just want to plug a few things I think are important for people. And, and just that the, the, the mainstream TV is doubling down on this bullshit. Like it's unbelievable to me what's happening. I don't want to do another full rant on this stuff, but the testing is off. I want to talk about that a little bit. Cause I got some emails about that and some, some scientific stuff about the testing. But I mean, it's the, it's, it's from the top to bottom. The information is, is all over the place. It's skewed. It's wrong. It's bullshit. And the mainstream media is just not doing, they're just propagating this this these lies i mean people are really falling for it so go to independent media man dr pam popper on youtube has a fantastic she's a doctor pamela popper that's her name yeah sounds like so a porn star yeah <laughs> <laughs> um and she does like a, a daily youtube thing and she she's organizing and this is for all you americans out there she's organizing make americans free again and she's co- collating all this all these people that are and she reads stories of people that are having problems with the tests and having problems with the the death certificates or this whole fucking covid mess and she's got quite a a following going i'm going to put a link in the in the show notes but she's she's also helping people do lawsuits so she pictures a whole bunch of fucking lawsuits for this, pe- these people that are, that are doing this. Cause she's got, she's gone to the bottom of 
all the, the, the fake testing, the fucking numbers of the deaths, like all this bullshit. So what she's visioning is if people do like, let's say they, they, they sue uh, their government in this county or the state over here, they're, they're going to share all those documents with everybody so that somebody can grab that lawsuit, change all the specifics in their area and then use it as well. So she's pushing back on a legal way against this bullshit. Hmm. It's fantastic. Plus she's, she just, she just does it like a little update all the time on their loss of freedoms down there. Like, I don't, I'm still, I'm still blown away by the whole thing. So anyway, it's weird when you get into a thing where half the population doesn't want to be free. I know. I know. Because as democracy goes, I, uh, yeah, I know. So that if 60% of you yeah, don't want to be free yeah. anymore, then they win and you're but not what free. What if that, what if that, that does lack of desire for freedom is based on false information? And and propaganda. Oh, this is where they get right. I mean, this is this is what's happening. This is literally what's happening. That's so, always been the plan. So, Whitney uh, Whitney Webb and the Last American Vagabond were on the Ripple Effect. So, if people go to the Ripple Effect podcast, they can go back uh, a couple episodes. Actually, maybe it was the latest episode, even. And f- it's fantastic. Like Whitney goes into the how deep the connections go with Maxwell and Mossad and. And, uh, computer IT stuff and gates. And I mean, it, it's just, it's, it's mind blowing. But then they also talk about the, the contemporary pan- pandemic that's going on. Um, that's a great chat for people to check out and just support your alternative people, people, your doctors on YouTube that are spouting the truth before they get kicked off or the, the you know, the podcasts, the, the things we do really appreciate it. America.ca slash sport. Join the team. We still got to make that wall, but we're, I don't know if we'll ever get to. I don't know if we'll ever get to. What, yeah, what that's was right. One thousand one hundred eleven. I think we're at like we're ways away. Mm-hmm. A couple hundred at least. Yeah. Anyway, keep those reviews coming. The last time I checked, we're at like nine hundred twenty-two. Yeah, that'd be ratings. fun to get to thousand ratings. We're yeah. only like seventy-five ratings yeah. away from a thousand. Yeah, that would probably be great. Boost, boost the algo before Might boost us right into the trash bin. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're out. Yeah. We're closing in on 10,000 YouTube subscribers too. If you want to head over there and subscribe, might get us kicked off of something there when we get to 10,000 too. Could be an exciting couple of weeks. We yeah. Kicked off everything. So I got an email or no, was it a chat? So I think somebody sent me this in, in the chats. I get confused over how I get it, but it was uh it was an awesome article on was the COVID-19 test meant to detect a virus? And it's talking about the PCR test after our last intro, when I was bitching about the, the testing, um, and I mean, I didn't even go over all the reasons why the testing is skewed. There's more even still. I mean, the CDC information is, I mean, you could use all this information against them. It's not their own information. I don't understand how it's getting to be the point where they're talking, they're, you know, they're saying everybody that's, uh, you know, not afraid of this thing is anti-science, yet their own institutions are giving you information that's going against the mainstream narrative. I mean, I don't understand how it can be possible that it's that, that's bad. Anyway, she says, uh, the Corona simulation machine, why the inventor of the Corona test would have warned us not to use it to detect the virus. And it's a huge, it's a long article. It's fantastic. Um, and it's on, uh, uncovered And she's, uh, I think she's one of these journalists that got kicked out of the mainstream. And even though she got awards and everything, but she wasn't playing along with the narrative. Uh, she's from truthbarrier.com, Celia Farber. So I'll put a link in the show notes to that. But it really goes into the details about the guy who created the PCR test during the AIDS thing. And he's he, he passed away a year or two ago. But uh, he, she mentions David Crow in here as well, which he's a he local guy away. who passed away. I mean, I don't know. I meant, to, I meant to research what happened to him before this intro so we could talk about it. But we almost had him on the show and we didn't. And uh, I heard somebody mention that the propaganda report was mentioning it might be an assassination or something. I don't know. I mean... He's, he was pushing back against this whole, you know, viral narrative pretty hard. Hmm. An assassination You, know, you didn't hear anything Canada? about it? I didn't, didn't know we did that kind it? of stuff here. We don't. I mean, the border's closed. A, How did they get in? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Dressed up as a truck driver. <laughs> yeah, you have to dig into that one for us. Me? You're like halfway down the hole. I'm halfway down the hole, yeah. I don't really want to go all the way to the bottom. Don't get yourself assassinated. 
Well, it's pretty weird. It gets pretty close to home when it's a local guy you were going to have on the show and he's pushing back against Viral Never and all of a sudden he's not alive anymore. It's mm-hmm. like, holy fuck, you know? That's and then, of course, chance. I was reading this from that person that forwarded it to me. I think it was Beth, uh, Elizabeth, maybe, in the chats. This is why Graham and, gets emails. <laughs> and and, and, and the, the, this lo- this awesome article is, you know, starts mentioning him, right? I mean, it's it's yeah, it's pretty crazy. It looks really sketchy. I mean, the places can just change the range, the cycle range of the test, and it, it can just change the, the, the it can make positives way more positive or way more negative. I mean, it's it's so subjective and and um, ambiguous. It can it's shouldn't be used to even diagnose. I mean, it's 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 a. I don't want to try and try and summarize it because uh, I won't do it any good. But it's more about. Um, manufacturing the the dna sequence as opposed to diagnose using it to diagnose Mm -hmm. yeah it's it's fucking weird (sighs) something's (sighs) up with those tests because i mean there's billboards all over calgary that are just saying come get tested had covid got covid no symptoms symptoms whatever just come get tested well then people are saying everybody uh, come get tested i just heard from the last american vagabond and and uh ripple effect that even if you've had the antibodies in the past so if i've had it in the past that's another test if i tested positive now that's going to show up as a new test as a new case yeah and it gets weird where they say the antibodies aren't you there's not going to be any herd immunity because the antibodies are good enough but so their fake antibodies are going to work though I, it's really starting to seem like it's just like how do you insert a new infectious disease how do you you know they've got this vaccine game they're making a ton of money i know how you but they're like it. they're out of diseases i know how you insert so like, it. how do we add a new you disease go, you don't you go with the old one that's always around yeah you always test a certain percentage of people 10 years ago, five years ago, five years from now, you're always going to get a bunch of Corona positive people. You know if what it you seems test like? Enough. It's like the American, it's so ambiguous the American and so system fucked. of like scam science yep. has taken over the world. Because mm-hmm. they've been doing this to their own people for ton, for years, right? I feel like they're yep. just taking that big pharma's taking over the world now. They're, they're done with America. Well, they, they're not happy with them, just America anymore. And I mean, they had most of us. But I really feel like now they're, they've finally got the ability to like start like manipulating the entire planet into Well, vaccines. maybe that's why Belinda and, and Fauci and Obama were in the Wuhan lab three years ago or wh- however many years ago they were there, five years ago. You see that picture of them in the lab after they gave millions to the fucking lab? Why are they giving money to Chinese labs? You, to do what you just <laughs> said was happening. It's to, it's to, push this this american style corruption from big pharma onto the world yeah it really feels like this is the push and, and i mean and, they tried putting on charity scams in canada i mean i don't know our government looks like it might be just falling apart <laughs> yeah well, i can't fair. believe some of the people i'm seeing calling for trudeau's head right now it's we're, he's just as corrupt as them all it's unbelievable yeah, yeah it's but the, and then the whole, even the ndp and the block are calling them out on it like God, our government's not gonna be able to get anything done for a couple of years now I mean, not that that's a bad thing. I'd rather have a handcuffed government than a liberal government than a or a conservative government. government. Just yeah, just like, money overseas. yeah, I'd just rather have them fighting all the time and not being able to really get anything fucking accomplished. Just leave us be. Just too busy arguing amongst each other. Fuck. Because there's like, they can't get the votes in any direction. And I really feel like that's a better system anywhere where they have to actually talk about stuff and debate about stuff and you, without some block or some liberals or some fucking NDP or some green party, you're not going to get your thing across. So now you've got to actually cross party lines and start talking to people about how you're going to make this fucking happen as opposed to I'm a liberal. So I do what the liberals say, or I'm a conservative. So I do whatever the party lines, party lines, fuck your party lines. Yeah. It's not what it's about. Yeah. You fucking bastards. Yeah. Oh, he's getting... <laughs> Getting granty over there. Anyway, it could be good because I, I mean, I see a real possibility that our government is uh, in some trouble, more trouble than I thought they'd ever get themselves in. I was actually looking to see if I still had the, uh, remember we used to have that old Graham rant jingle? Yeah. I don't think I see it here anymore though. How can that be? How can be? I know it's still in the, uh, in the folder. But have you seen, I mean, have you seen the articles now coming out from the mainstream sources? It's okay to yell at somebody that doesn't wear a mask now. I mean, they're really, the predictions are all happening, right? 
You're going to be ridiculed if you don't wear a mask. You're hurting everybody just like the anti-vaxxers. The anti-maskers are the new anti-vaxxers, right? Yeah. Even though the science is coming out of the fucking yin-yang on how bad masks are. You know, it's like a mosquito through a fence. You, there's enough doctors out there talking about it. I've got a great, there's a great article about all the scientific evidence that show that masks aren't good for the viral infections. It's even the good masks aren't, aren't good. I mean, it's, it's the science is overwhelming showing that. And what happened earlier on when, you know, they're worried about the virus getting in your eyes and don't touch your mask too much. Cause then you're putting your hands on the mask and then the mask has the virus and you can put your hands on your face and all that. I can <gasps> smoke weed right through my mask. Yeah. Still get high too. Yeah. yeah. It's not good, filtering yeah. anything yeah. out. Yeah. You just blow the smoke. Out, it's like, <sighs> actually I, I, a little I, comes out the side a little bit. Not that's, bad though. That's, that's, I don't know, man. This is just so weird. This is why you got to buy the America. This is bullshit mask. Cause they're going to oh, force you to right. make, Let's wear some masks here. So if you have, do we have any other ones out Grimerica, there? Uh, there's like a good vibes. There's a bunch of them. How about probably, pandemic or COVID-19 before? We don't have those, made, don't yet. Have those no, made yet. We could. Who, can somebody design those or how, can we ask for help to do that or? Yeah, I think, I think uh, she's doing it now. Awesome. I mean, That'd be great. But this is bullshit. It's flying off the shelves. Head yeah. over to grandamerica.ca slash swag. Grab some some of those masks now. And then at least when they're forcing you to wear a mask or you can't go buy food, you can still do some protesting yeah. while you're doing it. Yeah. Some peaceful protests. I still haven't really had to wear any masks anywhere. Yeah, me too. I'm, I've been pretty good since the since the one time I went for the, the haircut, which I said I won't come back if you guys don't relax. On the I mask, didn't have to man. wear it for the haircut. Recently, yeah, oh, good. So they maybe they already, have, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, fine. Wear it if people can wear them all they want. I don't care. I don't care if other people do. I'm not, I'm gonna give them a big smile so they can see the expression on my face and maybe realize, wow, when I smile, nobody sees it. We're turning into a bunch of automatons. Automatons is that a word? Of course, it is. Haven't you heard it in your dystopian audiobooks you're listening to? No, no. Am I listening to dystopian audiobook? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure that I am. <laughs> Isn't Dune kind of like that? I wouldn't call it dystopian. No. More it's just, just sci-fi, like, just straight sci-fi. Uh, maybe more like um, epic than sci-fi. Oh. So yeah. Anyways, enough of my rant. I just I I feel like people. Uh, they're stuck in their bubbles and there's no, there's no getting through to the people that don't want to be get getting through to the people that are saying, you know, you think the surgeons are wearing mat, you know, the people that are using the memes the other way, it's just, I don't know. There's no getting through to people. So I've almost been able to fully replace my entertainment with audiobooks now. Yeah. No more TV. And you're learning how to live off the land pretty much. Getting there, getting there. I could trade some chickens with Michael for some meat. I'd be in good shape. Meat? I thought you had lots of meat. I do have lots of meat, but I could use some chicken. Oh, some chicken meat. Trade some eggs red for meat chicken? for some chickens. Oh, okay. I don't want to eat my chickens. I'm busy making no, eggs. Yeah, 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 yeah. How's the egg going? How's the eggs going? Are you, are you overflowing with eggs still? Or are you oh, just... yeah. Yeah, I give away tons of eggs. Really? Yeah. Three a day and you give three away? Wow. I don't eat three eggs a day. Not even close. Probably a dozen a week. Yeah. Between me and, and you the caught kids. a couple deer the other day, last night. We shot two more deer last yeah, night. Good for yeah. you. Wow. We'll process them up tomorrow, yeah. and then that's probably probably. Should good I for plug deer. the fridge in for you? I got my freezer and stuff there. I can fit about. I took all the shit out of that one fridge, so I could put my meat bins right in there, yeah. and they hold ninety pounds each. I think I can fit six in there. Oh wow! Okay, so you're good. So for I can a while. get like okay. five hundred pounds in the fridge, and I think I'm good for about five hundred pounds in the freezer. Nice. Then I'll probably just buy another freezer after that. I mean, after that, I might just start jarring more of it. Yeah, jarring it and canning it, and doing stews and stuff like that. That'll be next. I'll be done sausage and all that shit after. That was a good garlic weekend. sausage I had. That yeah, was really good. Yeah, it's primo. Yeah, yeah. the pepperettes are good. Yeah. yeah. Good for you. Welcome That's pretty primo. good for your first time. Yeah, and it's only like another two months or a month and a half until the big harvest fucking sale at the thing. We'll go stock up on vegetables and all that. Away we go. 20 bucks to get in, and then everything's super cheap. Like, I think last year you get by a whole flat of strawberries for like fucking 20 bucks. Yeah, but do you think it's going to be the same this year? Or? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, it's the Canadian farmers getting rid of their 
stuff from BC and all that, right? So no, I know, but they still got to sell it. I mean, you know, they still got to sell it. Someone, yeah. yeah. Anything there might be more. Yeah, maybe with restaurants and everything moving less. Yeah. Yeah, Hopefully. I feel like it's really, I mean, I was also listening to those guys on Ripple Effect talk about the corporate takeover, and really that's the other part of this whole problem. It's not just the, the tracking and the vaccine. It's the it's the, the dis- dissolution of, dissolution? Dissolvement of small businesses. I mean, basically we're going to be stuck with a few corporations. and It's the fascism you know. again. I mean, it really is pretty funny. I shared it again today. No one gets it. Everyone's busy calling Trump fascist and Biden fascist, and they're all fucking fascist. I shared it again today, the definition, the original definition from McGowan's old book there from back in like the 70s or whatever. Why is this not fucking working? I think it was only in the 90s. The book. So, I mean, if you listen to this, the only fucking difference, if you just change it to two party instead of one party, then you got the U.S. Well, Fascism, it is one party. A system of government characterized by rigid one party, by a rigid one party dictatorship, forcible suppression of opposition, Private economic enterprise under centralized government control, belligerent nationalism, racism, and militarism, etc. So, if you just switch out the two party system, which are pretty much the same party, they argue about trivial things. That's but the new definition, though. That's the old definition. Where where was the corporate? It wasn't the corporate private thing? economic enterprise private under centralized e- government control, right? Which okay. is what we're creeping into now. Yeah. Big time. Well, I don't know if we're creeping into it. I mean, it's been it's just being exposed. Yeah, it's being I would exposed, say it's the, yeah. yeah, I would say the veil is lifting. It's already always been there. Well, it's creeping more into global, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So what was the what's the new definition? And they took out that private enterprise. Oh, part. I'd have to go look through it. Let me see. So that's the old definition and then that's they changed the old it. definition. The new definition doesn't say anything about uh let me see. I believe I was able to just search definition. Okay. Hmm. Webster's USA Today. Oh, no, I can't. So that's the first one. Little militarism, blah, blah, blah. It would take me a minute to find it in here for sure. Definition. Because I'm just searching an audio, or I'm just searching a Kindle book at this point. That's from the 1980s. Look also. Okay, so maybe this is the one that has the new definition. No. I feel like we're getting isn't working out. Yeah, let's just let's just not get into the new definition. But but you have the trust. last the last the last um paragraph of Part one of his book, we could read again. For the corporate capitalist state, and therefore the fascist state, is inherently imperialistic. The unbridled greed for greater profits for the few fuels the need for conquest. New labor markets need to be oppressed and exploited. New resource markets need to be raped and pillaged. And new consumer markets need to be created. The fascist state cannot rest until it devours every available market. So the wheels of globalization the media friendly euphemism for global fascism 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 like that too. works too <laughs> will continue to spin yet even as more and more of the world falls prey to the free market new enemies will continue to appear and american society will grow increasingly fractured and divided against itself for that is the way it has to be wow that's pretty good where was that from that was from david's book david's book yeah Thanks. that we narrated it's in the yeah. black budget feed isn't it Yes. That's what's the title again? Uh, the F of the meaning of fascism. No, what is it? F- understanding the F word. Understanding the F word. Yeah. Here's a quote from Mussolini: For fascism, the growth of empire, that is to say, the expansion of the nation, is an essential manifestation of vitality, and its opposite, a sign of de- decadence. But empire demands discipline, the coordination of all forces, and a deeply felt sense of duty and sacrifice. This fact explains many aspects of the practical working of the regime, the character of many forces in the state, and the necessary severe measures which must be taken against those who would oppose this spontaneous and inevitable movement. For never before has the nation stood more in need of authority, of direction, and order. Wow. You know, it's like what the U.S., that's going to be the argument that they use 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, right now yeah. they're setting the U.S. up for that argument. Yeah. 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 It's already, you can already see the narrative of uh, when the arrests are happening of all these vandals and they're getting let out of, out, out of, uh, they're not getting charged and they're already setting the federal government up from snatching these, these criminals, right? <laughs> I mean, they're still not even, call, even Fox News isn't calling it. Uh, riots are still calling it protests when people tear down statues. I mean, when you're tearing down a statue, is that called a protest? I mean, I I would say no. That's not really a protest. It's a violent protest if you're ruining property. Yes. I mean, and they, they're just letting the criminals go now. And then now the the federals are getting blamed for snatching these criminals. Portland's it's a fucking crazy what's Portland's happening. Coming. I mean, I don't think it's getting any better. I'm glad we're not in Portland. But while you're on quotes, let's quote uh, let's quote something from the from the book here. So governments are like primitive cannibals feasting on a great treasure trove of sheeple. You can't force them out and you can't vote them out, but you can sure as hell starve them out when enough people pick up and leave, essentially voting with their feet, it accelerates the system crash. That's a rat now. Yeah, that's, that's, that's people the just choice. dropping out. Yep. You're going to have to drop out. Arguing about it isn't going to fix anything. You just got to fucking No, because drop everybody's out. stuck in their, their paradigms. Yeah. I mean, people are going to wake up when they wake up. And we all probably still got a little waking up to do of our own. Yeah. Just don't worry about what anyone else is up to. Worry about well, what you're up to. I don't know, man. It's a hard, it's a hard one. When you can see the hypocrisy and the and lies, police, it doesn't mean you know police? the truth. Well, if you see the lies blatantly, you can just, shouldn't, do, do you have a, maybe some... I think just you being the point change out and those being, lies, living your best life yeah. and just that's the lead by example. I mean, if you're, if you're the collection of the five or six people you spend the most time with, then you're just, you know, you'll change your group and it'll slowly work its way out. I feel like just trying to change people's minds is just like, doesn't work. I know, I know what you mean, but you don't have to try and change their mind, but you just have to subtly point out shit. I think every, every little seed makes a difference. The well, they, it's so obvious. Only, I'm talking about but stuff that's only like if they find the seed on their own, not if you throw it at them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know, but you got to put them out there. Like it's like it's to, to me. It doesn't mean you know the truth or you have the truth, but pointing out the lies and the hypocrisy doesn't mean you have the truth. You can still point out the stuff. Like for example, the stuff from the CDC website, you know, or the NIH or the WHO, and the stuff they officially publish and the stuff that the media is talking about are completely different. So if stuff like that is pretty obvious. You're using their own institutions and their own data against them. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean you know the truth, right? Like, I'm not saying we're close to it, but if you can at least see that kind of hypocrisy, I think it's important. Maybe. To Maybe. point it out as a seed. In the I age mean, of information, there's just too much of it to get any points across. Yeah. Because they can yeah. just pile up and... Find those well, then the censorship studies. is an issue too. I mean, Facebook is, is a, the biggest. Facebook issue. is a huge cesspool right now. Twitter, there was a Twitter hack recently that I mean, that's funny. Holy, I mean, it's just the, the social media is a disaster right now. The golden age of social media is over. Yeah, I would say. Support the show. We can't keep doing this show if you guys don't support it. We love. I mean, we couldn't be doing it still if it weren't for the lovely motherfuckers that do already. We're going to put out some extra episodes, too. This is kind of an extra episode. The guys want to do an extra black budget. I think the Brat Pack wants to come back for another black budget in the chat, uh, in the Zoom. And then also want to. we're going to be doing a couple swap casts. We're going to be doing a couple double double weeks here where we do two shows a week. So we, that's, that's not... Swap cast coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Hit that support button, grandamerica.ca slash support. Tell your friends. Sign up for the newsletter. Like we said, that's super important. Join the chat. I got a synchro from chat. the chats and I got a trip report. I was going to read them, but we'll save them for next intro. Save and for maybe next there'll week. be some more in there by the time we go back. Let's go to the spam gram channel in the chats. All right, guys. Enjoy this chat with the fabulous David W. Matheson.
All right, welcome back to the show, David Matheson. It's been a while. Dave's been studying the world's myths and scriptures and sacred stories and kind of coming up with a celestial metaphor in his latest book, Myth and Trauma, how appropriately titled for this uh, 2020, Higher Self, Ancient Wisdom and Their Enemies. So thanks for uh, writing another tome, David, and coming on the show. Thanks for having me. This is like we were saying just a minute ago, this is the first podcast i've been on since the book was published so i'm oh, wow. excited to talk about it with you guys we can i've got a little slideshow presentation but we can really go where, whichever direction you guys want to go i sent one to you over a week ago but because everything is slower in the mail it is still making its way up to Grand america it sounds like as the last time i checked was yesterday i'm assuming they're not really moving too far today i'm expecting to get it tomorrow actually yeah right on but anyway we can uh i've got like a little presentation we can talk about but uh how have you guys been what what uh what what's on your mind i listened to a little bit of the previous interview that was very interesting thanks you mean the one with bruce like live or oh yeah i mean it was fantastic because he tied you know the evolution of us maybe you know et tweaked along the way eight hundred thousand years ago but going up to 70,000 years and then going, getting into like transhumanism and what's going on right now. And, uh, it's, uh, it was really interesting to tie in the contemporary takeover of Western <laughs> society into, into, or, or attempt at a takeover into, uh, you know, our evolution of the past. Yeah. Well, the takeover is not a new phenomenon. No, like that's the <laughs> thing. Exactly. But the more I learn about it, the more I shouldn't be surprised of what's happening, you know? Yeah, not, nothing just started in March, but uh, yeah, I didn't get to hear the whole thing, but I heard parts of it. Were you listening so, on the radio or on the YouTube? I, I I was on the Twitter, actually. I just pressed live on oh. on your tweet. Yeah, and it played right within Twitter. Oh, wow. What? Yeah. I wonder if we get credit for that view. Maybe we're getting millions of views we don't know yeah, about. Yeah, we're probably getting millions of views on Twitter, and it shows like one, one like. <laughs> this explains a lot. <laughs> anyway welcome yeah. back to the show dave we wish we would have seen you in april we'll see you in october actually we'll see you in we're actually gonna end up seeing a lot of you this year we'll see you in september and october and uh hey yeah, you I'm could not- always come up here in august and we could scope out that spot i've been telling you about where we might do uh we might do like a weird camping cack sort of thing out the- maybe a ce5 yeah. as well we could uh i've been wanting to take darren out looking for ufos man well, I was looking at some of the pictures that Darren was sending from his most recent trip out into the out into the wilderness, and it looked really beautiful. And I said, "Where is that? Maybe we can see some stars up there." And he said, "Oh yeah, you can see millions millions of stars up here. So maybe sometime in 2021, we'll see." But uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to the September contact at the cabin with Randall. Um, thanks for inviting me to that. I'm looking forward to going to that, and then. As you were mentioning, we have a big Bryce Canyon slash Zion National Park stars over Grimerica event where we're going to be talking about the myths and the stars in person in one of the best stargazing locations in the world at Bryce Canyon and uh, the desert, high desert altitudes should, I'm hoping it'll be really good stargazing conditions. And uh, we had to reschedule that because it, what was it planned for the middle of April? Supposed to be April sixteenth to nineteenth. Yeah, it was supposed to be April sixteenth to nineteenth. So, around March, we realized we had to push it back. So, we found a good stargazing window in October. I'm really looking forward to that, and hopefully, the national parks will uh, be open. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll have to figure it out. But anyway, I think it's going to work, and I'm really looking forward to that. So, as long as they open up the imaginary line here in between here and there, then we'll be okay. <laughs> and the Grimerica line is open, right? You guys have opened your borders or not? Oh, yeah. Ours are always open, man. <laughs> always open. <laughs> oh, Grimerica has open borders? <laughs> <laughs> Just big tariffs. High tariffs and open borders. <laughs> High tariffs. Really strict customs. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, so we can talk about the new book if you want. Any uh, Anything else that's on your mind? Any questions from the... <clears throat> chat rooms well, but I, I can sh- i can share a screen whatever you guys want yeah to do. i don't know Go if ahead, we want to get into current events and uh and and no, what's going on down are you in california you're in california right i'm in california i mean i don't I'm know we can stay california. away from that stuff if you want i mean 
it's really all connected, but maybe let's talk about um, individual stuff. Maybe people are tired of talking. Yeah, about that the, sounds good. Yeah. The current events. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's talk check about your slideshow in your books. I mean, really everything, all the issues that we deal with, this is when we talk about trauma, this is issues that in, impacts everybody. We live in a trauma inducing society, um, but really even the most cutting edge uh, healers are talking about trauma today. And I'll, I'll mention some quotations, but what I realized when I started hearing some of these uh, physicians and psychologists who are talking about psychological trauma, I realized, wow, this is exactly what the ancient myths, one of the things that the ancient myths are talking about. So the most ancient myths that we have are talking about this very cutting edge and very important to our lives issue of individual trauma or unhealed psychological issues. And, and the myths are helping us pointing our way towards recovery from trauma. And we'll get into what, what that might mean, but uh, even the very earliest myths. So it's not just something that modern society has to deal with if it's talked about in the ancient myths. But I do believe that societies can be more traumatic or less traumatic. And there is pretty good evidence that there are people who have designed traumatic events to traumatize people on purpose. So our society doesn't have to be as traumatic as it is, and it's getting more traumatic. If you look at the rates of things like depression, anxiety, people taking uh psychotropic medication to deal with depression and anxiety, those numbers are going up at a very uh, startling rate, which shows that we're, uh, we're having more and more of a traumatic society. And yet it uh, shouldn't be because we're in one of the most safest times. Like things are, things are generally, you know, in the, in Western culture lifted up at least to the point where things should be less traumatizing. I mean, compared to yeah. like, I think about how, how people dealt with that in the past where they were tr trained as warriors from the age of eight and they saw their friends die and their families die and they're constantly under a threat of, you know, war or whatever. Like how, how, how did they handle that? Did they just, was that just a part of their, you know, they, the trauma didn't affect them or were they just always traumatized? And yet here we are, you know, should be less traumatized and yet we're getting that way. Yeah. I mean, that's a really, really good question. And it's a really it's really interesting the way you framed it, Graham, because talking about, see, let's say you're 21 and you're dealing with traumatic issues. You're, you're off to the Trojan War as a Greek warrior or a Trojan warrior. Presumably, if you've been brought up in a cohesive, now, I think war is inherently traumatic. Um, and I think if you read the Iliad and the Odyssey, you'll see that it's traumatic and the ancient myths are talking about healing trauma, but there's a difference between being a well-adjusted adult dealing with painful or chaotic or uh, even physically violent situations and being a infant who is abandoned uh, when you're, you're terrified in your crib and your parents have been told, uh, just let him cry it out. That's good for the child to learn to just cry it out and shut up in their crib. See, a, 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 an infant can't deal with that the way a grown man or a grown woman can. And, and an infant needs connection from his parents. And really, since parents can always be available, you've got to have this kind of whole cohesive society. And if you think about hunter-gatherer societies where there's all kinds of uncles and aunts and grandmothers and grandparents around, where a child is, is very different from, you know, you said, hey, we're living in this nonviolent society where we're not really worried so much about someone coming, coming and cutting off our head with a sword every, you know, week. It's not a, not a major fear, but we're in a very atomized, splintered, divided society where kids are uh, away from their parents or parents have to work. It's not... And is it's not lacking connection fault. Right? Yeah. yeah, it's lacking connection. We've got we've got all these Facebook friends or Instagram 
followers or whatever we have, but we know that's not the same thing as real connection. So we're actually living in a very splintered society where we're looking for um, we're looking for that kind of connection. And if you're not getting that kind of connection as a child, it it doesn't matter if you were actually physically traumatized, you can be emotionally traumatized. If you're hurting and you're trying to deal with some issue, you're, you're frightened or you're uh, uh, in pain or something, and there's no one there to actually uh, comfort you and let you work through it, then what will happen is you'll divide, you'll, you'll, you'll develop a, a kind of a insulation from the pain and you'll separate from the sensors that are bringing that pain in, which has to do with our whole array of our gut and our uh, subconscious, all these things that are uh, bringing in information to us, we'll start to separate away from them and say, you know, I know you're telling me that I should be frightened right now, but my parents are totally uh, ignoring that. So I guess it's not important. And so you start to divide from it. Anyway, we'll talk that. I'm not sure if I'm explaining that perfectly well, but what happens is we divide from ourselves, And that is the heart of trauma as defined by some of these leading edge. I'm not a psychologist. Okay, but when I heard these healers like Dr. Gabor Mate, who I'm quoting, I'll quote a little bit, I quote him a lot in the book, I didn't even discover his work until after my second most recent book, which was The Ancient Worldwide System. But I talk about how the ancient myths are, they always have these sets of twins, and these sets of twins aren't really two different people, it's, it's a division of your own self. And so I was already realizing that the myths were talking about that. And when I started hearing some of these cutting edge psychiatrists and, and doctors who are dealing with addiction and seriously traumatized individuals who are trying to um, overcome addiction, and they're talking about it in the same, uh, the same way that the myths are talking, I realized, whoa, this is... There's a real application here that I think is really important. That's largely the genesis of this new book, Myth and Trauma. So I'll show you the I'll show you the, the cover. I'll share my screen and we'll and we can talk about it. But hopefully, does that does that trigger any questions? Or yeah, does that seem to make sense. Yeah, it makes you wonder how because you hear about the people that have PTSD from kids or from childhood. Can they disassociate? I mean, they learn to basically like what you say, separate from yourself or disassociate from your body into the astral realm or a lot of these people have psychic abilities or they can astral travel. Like what does that do? Like the amount of trauma that now are in kids. And it's not like I was saying physical trauma from the threat of war, but it's that different lack of connection. Let's say, I mean, what is it doing to our society that, that, I mean, is there a, is it, is there a, uh, <clears throat> Well, yeah, An, unintended some, benefit yeah. that people are people are learning that this isn't a materialistic world that they live in. Okay, well, that's a good, that's a really interesting question. Good. So, I would say that a lot of those things that you're talking about have to do with our higher self, our essential self, our authentic self, and we'll get into that. If yeah, um, yeah, but what trauma does is separate us from our authentic self. Right. When what I love about I mean, one of the things I love about Grand America is you talk about synchronicities and what are synchronicities? Well, I would say that in, uh, in many cases, if not in all cases, certainly in most cases, it has to do with a message from your essential self, your higher self. And your higher self is connected to the universe. So when we get this connected from our higher self, we get disconnected from our connection to the cosmos. So, um, yeah, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but it's a really good question. I mean, Graham, you're already kind of all over it. So, well, because I mean, because there's also the on it. there's also the potential for it to be disastrous with people if people are entering into these other realms through trauma and they don't know how to deal with it, then maybe they're bringing back. Um, 
entities or energies that uh, are destructive to us and society. You know, there's well, that, there's and that I that think as well, we have so. those energies inside of ourselves too. I mean, yeah. the, the the subconscious is not all unicorns and rainbows. Um, so all the gods of the ancient myths, I'm convinced, work their way out through men and women. And uh, some of the gods are <laughs> depicted as benevolent, and some of the gods are depicted as malevolent. And but when we get disconnected from ourself, um, we get disconnected from the whole realm of the universe. So let me let me uh, let me use a metaphor to try. I mean, people might be going, uh, "This is kind of interesting, but it's kind of way out there. I don't know if this really applies to me. I've never astral traveled." Let me use a metaphor to try and uh, set some terms. And um, so this is Myth and Trauma just came out 2020. Can you see the screen now? Yep. Great. Okay. So I want to use um, the myths use these metaphors all the time, but I'm going to use one that's not from an ancient myth, but it's probably more familiar with more viewers right now. And that is from J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. So we all know that there are how many Gandalfs in the Lord of the Rings? There's Any a few, idea what yeah. I'm driving at? Yeah, there's gray and white. Yeah, there's yeah, a couple, but, right? Yeah. So mainly there's two. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't know. I thought <laughs> the answer was, I'm looking for I thought maybe two. like, is there more than two? But yeah. 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 So Gan there's Gandalf the gray and Gandalf the white. This is a screenshot from when Gandalf has kind of disappeared from his friends. You remember what happens? Yeah, he goes down yeah, in the mine. The Balrog, yeah, yeah, and he, yeah. he has to wrestle with a Balrog. Right, he falls. He says, "You know, I fell so far, uh, you know, down into the depths of the earth. I just kept falling out of, and then out. Of, yeah, I wrestled to the bottom of the bottomless pit, to the top of the highest uh, tower, and they show him kind of. Uh, and then he at last he smote. He says, "I smote my foe at the side of the mountain." And I traveled out of all space and time until, poof, I came back to you. And now he's a different Gandalf. He's Gandalf the White instead of Gandalf the Gray. So there's, there's two Gandalfs, but really it's the same Gandalf. It's just he's coming, he's, he's in a, di there's a different aspect of Gandalf. Well, anytime you see that in a myth, these two, two different characters, but they're really one character. I would argue that has to do is trying to show us whether Tolkien was doing it consciously or subconsciously. It has to do with a disconnection from our deeper self, our higher self, our essential self from whom we become disconnected. And we have to kind of wrestle with the Balrog to, to get it back, to get back in that connection. Um, the myths talk about that. Uh, there's another character in the Lord of the Rings who has two kind of two aspects in one, one character. Can you Frodo? Frodo's a good guess. <laughs> he's kind of starting to, he's starting to develop a second character, not necessarily a good one, but Boromir? there's one who's like, who's, there's one who's suffered a lot. Yeah. Um, Gollum. I'm thinking, no. yeah, he's got like definitely two personalities cause he's, he's suffered a lot of trauma or a lot of disconnection, a lot of loneliness, right? Underneath the mountain, he's down there all by himself. He's, he's, his mind's kind of gotten taken over and there's, and then he has these arguments with himself sometimes. In fact, he's always talking about himself in the second, uh, the third person, the yeah. first person plural, <laughs> yeah. like yeah, yeah. we or yeah. us, right. it hurts yeah, us. Yeah. It hurts us. Yeah. Right. So the golem character is, so what I'm trying to explain is we have a, we have like a higher self that we've become disconnected from because of trauma. And we have this kind of defense mechanism that we develop because of trauma. And that's the Golem character. There's like the, the sweet <laughs> Smeagol character. And then he's totally dominated by this Golem character and the Golem character. Remember when Smeagol says, Hey, master, Master helps us. I, we can't strangle him in his sleep, you know. <laughs> and and then Go, the Golem character says, "Nobody likes you. Nobody, <laughs> you know. You're a murderer. I saved us. I'm the one who got us through this. Remember that yep. scene? He says, 
you know, where would you be without us? Where would you be without me? I saved us. That golem character is a defense mechanism for dealing with the, the pain, the trauma of the world. We can talk about different forms of trauma, but actually in the society that we live in, almost everybody experiences some kind of trauma. And it's not because your parents weren't, weren't loving and caring. This is all, I'm repeating the words of Gabor Mate. I'll show you some, uh, Gabor Mate, sorry, I'm uh, pronouncing his name wrong, but uh, Gabor Mate talks about, it's not because your parents didn't love you, but it's because of, we're in a traumatic society. They may have anxiety that gets, that you pick up on and you develop a defense mechanism that's like the golem character. It's like, uh, it's like a, a tough persona that you, that you don't even realize that it's kind of taking over. And what it does is it kind of buries the essential self. So this is a quote from Dr. Gabor Mate. And he's, uh, he's a physician who was born in Hungary during World War II, during the, the Holocaust, and he's Jewish. And so he experienced childhood trauma. And then he lives in Canada. So I'm pretty sure he still lives in Canada, but he worked with um, the addicted uh, people who have bad addictions in Vancouver. Um, in British Columbia. Yeah. Good book. Very, very high. Yeah. The, the realm, realm of, of hungry, hungry ghosts. ghosts. Yeah. yeah. So he talks about trauma as a lot of people focus on, well, Oh, I didn't have trauma in my childhood or I wasn't sexually abused or emotionally abused, but he explains it's not necessarily, certainly there are, those are traumatic and those, can cause you to disconnect from yourself. But there are all kinds of things that an infant or a one-year-old or a two-year-old or even a young child can experience some kind of societal uh, angst or really uh, you know, rejection from your friends. And if, if you don't have adults that are there to help you understand it, you can disconnect from who you are, or you will, without even knowing it. It's a disconnect from you're getting these signals and you're and they're they're overwhelming you you don't have anyone else to help you you will as a defense mechanism disconnect from those signals from from where those signals are coming from and so you'll start to turn off parts of yourself because it's too painful so the trauma is not the the things that happen to you the trauma is what happens inside of you, not, not the external things. Because even if you can, if you're a, a well adjusted, let's say you grew up in a perfectly loving, uh, let's think of like a, a very tight tribe in the Amazon somewhere where you know exactly who you are as you're growing up. Your father is always with you, taking you on trips into the jungle, teaching you about different plants, um, teaching you how to hunt. You don't have a real uh, question of who you are. You, you're, you're interacting with your peers, but they're not making fun of what you're wearing. There's meaning in their lives, it seems. There's, yeah, and you're very, and, and if your dad has gone on a hunting trip, you've got an uncle who takes you under your wing, or you've got other adults around, and you're very secure in who you are. You may encounter as a 18 year old or a 21 year old, a dangerous situation. Maybe you're walking through the jungle by yourself, far from everybody else, and you fall off a steep cliff and you're hanging by a, you know, a vine. But you are in tune with who you are. You're able to tap into a much wider range of, of your entire self to get you out of that situation. You're going to be in a lot better situation than someone who's disconnected from themselves and goes into a panic mode and can't, and has already been cut off from a whole range of um, who you are, of, of what your body is telling you. Uh, I mean, this is just a, a metaphor I made up on the spot. It's not in the book, but 
but I'm trying to answer your question, Graham, that you asked about, you know, back in the ancient times, there was so much more violence in the world. But if you were more connected with who you are, you're more able to handle uh, traumatic or, or painful or chaotic situations as an adult. So it may not even be that the world around us is more uh, difficult than the world of, let's say, the 1920s or the 1930s. But if all the people in that era grew up in a much more, I don't know, uh, supportive kind of childhood and they're, they just have a much deeper connection to who they are, they're probably able to handle those more things more resilient yeah. than today, right? Yeah. And it also, Gabor Mate talks about if you're a very sensitive person, some people are more sensitive than others. Sensitive, creative uh, children will feel uh, emotional pain more severely than you know someone who may not be as sensitive. So it's different for every person, but that trauma that you go through, or the, the trauma is the disconnection. It's the reaction to what you went through. So you shouldn't compare. Well, I didn't go through something as bad as you know my friend who was. Uh, always beaten by their dad. My dad never beat me. So my, my situation, you know, you can, the trauma is what's on, on the inside, the disconnection. And that can happen to you, even if you grew up in a perfectly loving environment. So um, that is how we disconnect from the essential self and the, the, we develop this golem persona, or I, I use the golem character is like a metaphor for this egoic mind, this doubting mind that's always like, oh, should I wear this? People might make fun of me. Or I mean, you, you develop that as just part of going to elementary school, middle school. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it's traumatic. Yeah, yeah. And if you don't have this like deep sense of who you are, which Jeez. comes from a family, you can, you can unwittingly and unconsciously, as it says here, this is another quotation from Dr. Gabor Mate, if our environment can't support our gut feelings and our emotions, then the child, in order to, quote, belong and fit in, which we all recognize this because Western society does this, then you're going to suppress your emotions, your connections to yourself for the sake of staying connected to the nurturing environment, without which the child cannot survive. Well, that's a great example, the school, because I was trying to think of what, uh, <clears throat> you know, in ways where we are traumatized or, or the way we deal with these things in the wrong way. And school would be a great example. I mean, that it, everybody has this issue in school for the most part. I mean, most people. I mean, it's it's just a, it seems like an automatic thing that comes along with school. Because like I, I, I think about that a lot because in addiction and alcoholism, trauma is always used as, you know, people go through trauma. And there's a, a there's people, and like like myself too, that I don't remember anything super traumatizing, but what you're saying here makes sense that it we've been affected. Almost all of us have been affected to one level or another and of disconnecting and disassociating with ourselves. And Dr. Mate says, if you have an addiction and it doesn't have to be an addiction to a hardcore drug like heroin or opioids or, you know, crack cocaine, but if you have an addiction, it could be any kind of a behavior that soothes some pain, but it has negative consequences. Yeah. And yet, despite those negative consequences, you can't give it up. That's an addiction. And he says, don't, don't, first of all, don't look at the, the addiction. Don't look at the negative consequences. First, look at the positive consequences. What is it doing for you? Why did you turn to that in the first place? It's, it's soothing something. Yeah. Some kind of disconnection. Yeah. It's it's giving you peace of mind. It's giving you uh a feeling of being connected. It's giving you a feeling of self-worth or whatever, greater feeling. Those aren't bad things. You're looking for something that you actually need, but somehow you weren't able to get that as a child. And our society kind of excels at not giving that to you as a child. So Therefore, we have to look for external things, and our whole society is built on giving you these kind of substitutes, and our whole economy is based around giving you these kinds of substitutes. But um, 
it didn't have to be some very, you know, textbook tr traumatic situation like sexual abuse. Certainly those do, Dr. Mate says, there's not a woman I dealt with in Vancouver who was a, a terrible addict, who had very bad addiction, who was not uh, sexually abused as a child, not one. Mm. And he was working in Vancouver for 10 years and saw literally hundreds of yeah. people that he tried to help. But, 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 but what I was going to say is the other part is he's, he's not the only voice who's talking about this. He's a, he's one of the leading voices who's talking about this. Peter Levine is talking about this. Other doctors are talking about this, but they still say for the most part, this is not even taught in medical school. You can go through all the way through medical school and I'm not a doctor, but you can be, go all the way through medical school, school and never even learn about trauma. And so what's amazing to me is the ancient myths are clearly talking about this. Um, I'm not an expert on, you know, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a doctor. I am for the past 10 years studying the myths very deeply. And I can tell you for sure the myths talk about trauma. The whole Adam and Eve story is about trauma and shame. They're, at first, they're naked and they're unashamed. And then they're full of shame and they have to cover themselves. And then the, you know, they're, they're, they're accusing each other. Well, he gave me the apple or she gave me the apple. And, well, it wasn't, it wasn't my fault. It was that woman you gave me. And it's all uh, the, the trauma is, and the separation from one another is very clear in that story. The separation from the divine realm is clear in that story. The separation from nature is clear in that story. They get kicked out of Eden. It's a metaphor. It's not literal. And I can prove that it's a metaphor. That's the connection to the stars that we can talk about later. But it is talking about disconnection. Not only are they disconnected from, they're disconnected from one another. Before they were loving together, unashamed, naked. They could see who each other was completely, completely naked and yet unashamed together. And now all of a sudden they're accusing each other. They're separated from each other and they're even separated from themselves. They're, they have shame in who they are and they can't even, uh, and they're disconnected from the divine realm as well. So the myths I can show you from, from, uh, Myths from ancient Egypt, myths from ancient Mesopotamia, myths from the Americas, they are talking about trauma and how to overcome it. And yet they've been twisted, as you mentioned in the, the subtitle of the book is ancient, uh, higher self, ancient wisdom and their enemies. These myths have been twisted into something that actually, <laughs> I, uh, I laugh, but only in a uh, cynical way, um, not in a joyful way. They've been twisted into something that actually uh, inflicts trauma on people. Uh, you know, oh, original sin, you're going to hell. And, and uh, we have the right to dominate these other cultures that don't believe in this myth or that myth. So they're actually there to help us, but they've been twisted into something that, that actually makes our world more traumatic. So that's what this book's about. What, what, are, some can, of the, what are some of the other examples then, like the Egypt or the... Uh... Yeah, we'll get. We, I'll, I'll show you a couple. Um, yeah. But this is the. Uh, yeah, let, let me show you a couple. But this is kind of the picture of the separated self, the uh, that I just created based on this metaphor of the two people uh, that that are in one person. Now I know in the Tolkien, it's not Gollum and Gandalf are not one character, but we create this persona, this defense mechanism, and we bury our essential self, because our essential self being connected to our self is too painful because our self is telling us, Hey, I want you to express, uh, I want to express myself this way. And when you go to school and you get laughed at, uh, expressing yourself that way, you're like, okay, I'm going to bury that part of who I right. am. And so, um, now I'll show you some myths. Th this is a, a token, um, uh, version of that dynamic going on but we create this golem persona and we don't even like the golem persona a lot of times we're like why did i say that oh i hate myself oh mm -hmm. i wish i could get rid of i wish i could get rid of that aspect of me which just like smeagol tries to do he says go away and never come back how's that work <laughs> doesn't work out at all 
right? He's like, he, t- he tells the golem, go away and never come back. Well, that's not how you get back in touch with your essential self. You can't just destroy this persona that it was created as a defense mechanism and it doesn't just go away. But the myths show how to get back in touch with your essential self over and over. They show it. So would you, would you say that when you say essential self, is that the same as higher self and authentic self? Yeah. I use those terms uh, interchangeably? interchangeably. Okay. Higher self, even divine self. This is a picture of Castor and Pollux from the Greek myths. This is actually from a ancient uh, bowl, ancient pottery bowl. I just, um, use some photo editing to put it in front of some stars. But those are the two twins, the Gemini twins of Castor and Pollux. And one of them, if you know the myth, you realize that one of them is actually mortal and one of them is actually divine. So I'm, I'm answering your question, Graham. It could be called the divine self sometimes. It could be called the higher self. I know you're familiar with some of the Eastern traditions where they talk about Atman. Have you heard of Atman and yep. Brahman? And, and there's a saying in one of the Upanishads that says, Brahman is all and Atman is Brahman, which means, and I may not be pronouncing those exactly perfectly, like people go to school for decades of their life to learn Sanskrit and the right pronunciation. So apologies if I butchered any of the pronunciation, but higher self is sometimes called Atman or it's spelled like Atman. A-T-M-A-N. And it's we each have this higher self, and yet it's connected to the whole universe. Brahman is all, the divine is everything, and yet Atman is Brahman. So there's a, a piece of the universe in the higher self, or the essential self is connected to the cosmos. And that's how you hear the voice of the gods, or that's how you get that message. That some of your some of your listeners have sent in synchronicities where they've said, I just got this feeling to step on the brakes. And if I hadn't, that truck would have just T-boned me. Well, where did you get that little voice? It's tied in. There are there are examples where people have gotten a message where you could say, okay, it's your subconscious was you know, your deep subconscious was able to maybe hear that truck approaching your conscious mind, your golem mind that was thinking about, uh, do I look good for this date that I'm on my way to? Is my hair okay? And did I wear the right shoes? It's not paying attention, but your deeper subconscious may have heard that truck and giving you realizing that you're about to get uh, just splattered on the pavement, told you, don't go right now, step on the brakes. So we could explain that with the subconscious, but there are people who have gotten messages that can't even be explained by the subconscious where they got a message from like about a friend who's in a totally different uh, part of the country, you know, thousands of miles away. And they, they pick up the phone and, and call and they're like, how did you know to call me? Your, your higher self is tapped into something even bigger than your subconscious. But but I would say you can call it your higher self, your essential self, your authentic self. If you're disconnected from your authentic self, you're not able to hear the voice of the universe as, as well, I think. Yeah, and I think so, it's important to know there's ways to to get connected too. Like we had, uh, you know, our, our guest, Eric P. Anthony, who wrote this book called Song of the Immortal Beloved on Spiritual Alchemy. And he puts in, in there his meditations on actually how to do that. And if you do that a little bit, you can focus on these different emotional events in your, in your past, and then focus on a part of uh, one of the centers of your body. And you go from center to center, focusing on different emotions and start trying to feel how it it is in those centers. And as you begin to realize how the different emotions feel, the, the false self starts to peel away really. And, and what you're left with is your authentic self. So it is, there is a, you know, a, a real difference when you start working on, on that. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think there are ancient disciplines and, you know, the, the, the method that you just explained of getting in touch, like listening to different parts of your body and, and those centers that we're just basically covered with sensors. Our gut is like a, a gigantic, you know, 10,000 sensors, but a lot of times we don't listen to our gut or we're like, Oh, be quiet. But 
it's because as a child, if let's say we were terrified and our gut was sending us all this danger signals, and yet somehow our parents minimized it or said, hey, don't cry or whatever, or, or just left us alone and didn't allow us to work through you and start integrate those yeah. you yeah. start to suppress you say okay yeah. i mean with, you don't say it consciously but unconsciously this happens to where the golem mind says man i keep getting hurt i'm gonna have to shut off that part the golem persona is created through trauma it's it's a that's why gandalf even says to frodo at one point you have to have compassion on golem he got that way because of basically, you know, pain that could happen to uh, uh, unresolved pain that could happen to anybody. But so anyway, back to these two characters here, the, the two youths of Zeus, they're sometimes called Castor and Pollux. One of them is human mortal. One of them is divine. And that is a pattern that we find over and over in the myths. And so what I would argue is when you see that, it's not talking about two different people. That is talking about telling you, you have two aspects to who you are. And so we find twins in myth after myth after myth around the world. And it's talking about, we have a mortal self and we have a divine self. And a lot of times these stories have to do with going down to the underworld. In fact, in the Castor and Pollux, Castor dies and Pollux his Greek name is Polydeuces, goes to Zeus and says, father, because Zeus is their father, I can't live without my brother. And Zeus says, you know, well, I'll give you a choice. You can, you can uh, be immortal all the time and dwell here in Olympus with me, or you can spend half the time down there in, in the uh, underworld and bring your, bring your brother up to the mortal world. But you'll have, to, you'll have to go through death. But half the time, he'll get to come up to Olympus. So." it's it's talking about our our higher self is uh raising our mortal self but uh it it involves going down into the darkness and i think a lot of that has to do with meditation or one it, it's down inside of ourself that's where you find your higher self that's where you get reconnected i'll just uh whip through you can go ahead and respond to that i'll whip through a few more this is actually an ancient Mesopotamian uh, carving, and some people believe, and it probably is, uh, that it's Gilgamesh and Enkidu battling with Humbaba. Hmm. Remember how, uh, remember how uh, Gandalf had to fight the Balrog? Gilgamesh and Enkidu wrestle with Humbaba. Um, that, that pattern is found over and over in, in myths as well. So Gilgamesh and Enkidu are these two heroes that are so alike that everybody, whenever they see them, says, wow, Enkidu looks just like Gilgamesh, except he's covered with hair. Gilgamesh is two-thirds divine. Enkidu is actually a wild man who is, at first, he's covered with hair and lives with the animals of the field. So it's the same pattern of kind of semi-divine and mortal. And actually, uh, in that myth, also Enkidu has to go down to the underworld and Gilgamesh just kind of loses it. It's the same. He mourns for his other half that has to go down to the underworld. Is he not supposed to turn around and look or something? And he does. Is that the same? Uh, that's a different one. But oh, that's, that's, a, a, that's, yeah, yeah. that's a great pattern. That's, yeah. a, that's a huge myth pattern. That's the Orpheus myth that yeah, you're right, thinking right. of. Yeah. But actually that pattern is found around the world. It's not just in Orpheus. Orpheus and Eurydice is in ancient Greece. That is found across North America, and all the Native American nations have a, an Orpheus type of a story. And uh, Japan, there's an Orpheus myth where he can't look back, and of course he does. Um, so that, I think that is related to this story. So that's a great, great, uh, great thought, Graham, on that one. And actually, I've got some slides later on. They're just like in reserve in case we talk about different things. I've got an Orpheus slide that we can look at. But these are, uh, speaking of the Americas, these are some twins in the myths of the Maya. So this is from Central America. The twins, their names are Hunapu and Ishbalanke. 
they go down to the underworld as well, and they have to uh, they have to undergo these ordeals in the underworld and and pass all these different challenges that the the lords of the underworld throw at them. But it's a it's the same pattern that we're finding around the world. These twin pattern myths that I would argue are teaching us the same thing that I was trying to explain using Golem and Gandalf a little little bit ago. This is a this is the engraving of this is a biblical story. I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, two twins, and one of them is is giving away his birthright for a mess of pottage for that that bowl that's in his hand. There, he's saying, "Okay, you give me the soup, uh, you give me the the meat stew, I'll give you the birthright." Do you know that story? No. It's Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau. And interestingly, in the Jacob and Esau story, Esau is described as being covered with hair, just like Enkidu Mm. in the Gilgamesh story. So it's another twin pattern myth that's dealing with the same pattern that we're finding around the world. This is actually, probably can guess which hero that is on the left. He's got a lion's kind of skin over his head, and you can see it on around his waist, and he's fighting this monster with multiple heads. That's the famous hero from ancient Greece. Come on. He fights the Hydra. I was going to say Hydra. Hercules. Yeah, that's Hercules. <laughs> we, we know him mostly by his Roman name, Hercules. In ancient Greece, his name was Heracles. We don't really know. Um, it's not as widely known, but Heracles is also a twin. Just like in the twin story of Castor and Pollux, Heracles has a divine father and uh, a mortal mother, okay? You can think of another figure from the Bible who has a divine father, but a mortal mother. You might get Jesus. <laughs> That's right. But two for two. actually, in most of these sets of twins, the mortal father actually sleeps with the mother after Zeus has visited, because Zeus doesn't want to be, uh, you know, doesn't want to be found out as having all these affairs. So he lets the mortal father come in later. And so usually there's a set of twins. One of the twins is the son of Zeus by the mother. And then the other twin is the son of the ordinary father, who's usually a king, but he's mortal. He's not Zeus. So in the case of uh, the divine twins, Castor and Pollux, Zeus comes down and uh, has an affair with this queen of Sparta. Her her name is Leda. And... uh, and and then later that night the king uh comes comes back and sleeps with his wife and then so there's two sons castor is the son of zeus and and the queen and uh, I'm sorry pollux polydeuces is the divine one and castor is the mortal one same thing with hercules he has a brother named iphicles iphicles is the son of the king and the queen hercules is the son of the queen and zeus on the same night so that's why they're twins, but one's mortal, one's. But the whole, I mean, the whole the whole reason for that complicated story is to have a mortal and a divine twin, and it's a picture of us. We have a mortal aspect and a divine aspect, but we forget the divine aspect. We don't even we're not even aware that we have a higher self. If you talk to people and say, "Oh, your higher self," they'll go. What are you talking about? Don't give me that higher self stuff. What have you been doing too much yoga? I mean, I don't have a higher self. Yes, you do. You have an authentic self that you separated from. Remember that that quote from Dr. Mate? He said, without even knowing it, you'll suppress who you are. You don't even know about your higher self. That's why these myths are there to try and teach you that you have a higher self. Hmm. So is it like a three-way then? (laughs) <laughs> you're getting back to the, the details of the story <laughs> they're not all there together <laughs> zeus takes off and then he lets the king come back does that sure? answer your question <laughs> does that answer your question darren um <laughs> well the gods work their way out through mortal men and women i actually think the gods um work their way out through people so they are not in the physical realm they're in the spiritual realm but 
Um, I'm just going to move on from that comment that you made, Darren. That's a good, it's a good question. Um, you can go to the myths yourself. I'm, I'm trying to point people to the myths. If you go to the myths, you can figure, you can, there may be lessons in there that, you know, I haven't, haven't brought out. I'm not, I'm not the interpreter of the myths. I'm pointing people to the myths, but I'm telling you these myths will, were, I believe were designed to help you recover your authentic self. Uh, I'm not, I can't help. I can't recover anybody else's authentic self. The only authentic self that I can recover is my authentic self. You, nobody else can recover your authentic self for you. I can't, no one else can, but I think the myths are a tremendous uh, resource to help you do that. So I don't have the, I don't have the definitive interpretation of any of these. Um, I'm just telling you what I, I've, uh, the way I'm interpreting them based on uh, looking at them for a long time and realizing that they're star myths. Uh, let's see a couple more. So all of those have been male, but we have, there are, there are female twins. There are female, um, there are female characters that, that, play that play out this same story to try and help us get back in touch with our higher self this is a statue it's from a uh, famous sculptor named or his nickname was canova but this is a statue depicting the reunion of eros and psyche eros and psyche mm. psyche is the the woman well you can tell right there by her name this this is an ancient story. This is an ancient myth, Eros and Psyche. You can tell by her name that she has something to do with that self that I've been talking about. In this case, I would say she has to do with the doubting egoic mind, the psyche that's been created, this, the egoic self, the persona that we develop due to having to deal with society that she wants to get back in touch with Eros, the powerful this powerful God that is her lover, but she doubts him. She doubts him and she loses him in this story. Uh, in the story, she's, she's the most beautiful woman in the world, but uh, her parents say, oh, she's more beautiful than the goddess of beauty. That's always a recipe for disaster. Uh, so the goddess of the real goddess of beauty, Aphrodite or Venus uh, sends all kinds of terrible calamities on the, on the country for, you know, claiming that a mortal daughter is more beautiful than the source of all beauty. <laughs> and so they send her away, but Eros, who has fallen in love with her and who's actually the son of Aphrodite, um, rescues her and takes her to a beautiful palace. It's like a lot of fairy tales where she's in this beautiful palace, but she, she's waited on by all these invisible servants that she never sees. She goes to bed at night and then uh, an invisible husband comes and makes love to her, but he says, listen, you know, when the lights are all out and he says, listen, you can't ever turn the lights on while I'm here. You can't ever see who I am. And after a while, she starts to have doubts in her mind. Like, I don't know who this really is. Everything is wonderful. He's always kind to me. He says he's a God, but she's, she's like, I'm, I'm lonely. I want my sisters to come visit. So her sisters come visit. They become jealous at this palace she's living in. They start to say, well, when do we get to meet your husband? And she says, well, you can't really meet your husband. He says no one can uh, be allowed to see him. And they go, oh, he must be a monster. He must be a giant serpent with wings. He must be a slimy worm. He must be, you know, horrible. Why don't you, uh, <laughs> why don't you hide a, a lamp? And after he falls asleep, after you make love and he falls asleep, light the lamp and see what he really looks like. And you'll find out you're probably married to a hideous, you know, troll or something and the sisters go away and the doubts keep nagging at her keep nagging at her and finally she she carries out the plan and and lights the lamp after he's fallen asleep and sees oh it's the most beautiful handsome you know god of love eros and a drop from the a drop from the lamp of course falls on his shoulder he wakes up and says why did you doubt me that's it and he flies out the window and she's, she's alone, never uh, gets to see him again. 
<laughs> Sounds like he was a bit of a booty caller anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Darren. This is a metaphor. So uh, she ha- she has lost her higher self. She's lost connection to her to her divine self, the divine aspect through doubt. And so she has to go on this big search to try and reconnect. And eventually she does. Just like in the Gandalf scene, she basically dies and then he revives her with a kiss. And so this statue is actually called Eros reviving Psyche with the kiss of love. Huh. And that's in the ancient myth. So, and, and you see that in fairy tales over and over, like Sleeping Beauty or whatever, uh, Snow White. But it is this pattern is you have to look for your divine higher self because you've lost it not necessarily through any fault of your own, just through the human human life, uh, what you go through in life, you develop doubts. Why do you develop doubts? To keep from getting hurt. Why did the golem persona develop? He's trying to protect and survive in the miserable situation that he's in. So we develop doubts to keep ourselves from getting burned, to keep ourselves from, from harm. And yet those doubts that we've developed to keep us from harm, the, the, that persona, that psyche that we develop, s- separates us from our true powerful nature. It keeps us, holds us back from what we could attain. We self-sabotage ourselves. We get into addictions uh, because we're trying to soothe, but we realize I'm, I'm sabotaging. I'm, I'm not being who I could be. You've got to reconnect with who you really are. And that's what this story is talking about, but it's not easy. Psyche has to like wander all over the place, trying to find her lost lover. Same thing in the Osiris myth. Isis has to search all over the earth to try and find the buried slain God, Osiris. It's a similar pattern. Hmm. So, uh, and it's actually, it, uh, I would argue, and I spend some time on this in a number of my books, but also in this one, the, the, this is the scene of, do you know, this famous scene, this famous episode from the gospels. No. Remember psyche lost Eros because of her. Her lamp doubts. oil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lamp oil. Right. <laughs> Because, but why was she using the lamp? Yeah, because she doubted. She was overcome by doubt. So this is the story of doubt. doubting, doubting Jesus. Thomas. Thomas doubting Thomas. Very good, Graham. Graham gets Ooh. a star. Isn't that a racist? Star, Darren. <laughs> what a star. Oh, that's Uncle Tom. Uh, come on, man. <laughs> Can you edit that part out of the live feed? Which part? Uh, this is. Doubting Thomas. So yeah, but people who are named after Thomas are named after, this is the, Thomas is actually his, he's called in the gospels, Thomas, the twin, Thomas, Hmm. the twin, which matches right up with the twin patterns that we've been talking about. So he's actually a very, very important figure because he represents us and how we reconnect with our higher self, our divine self. What keeps us back from our divine self is doubts, all these defense mechanisms that we're that have been created because of trauma, um, all these, even subconscious, uh, we're not even aware of them. But, but he's, he, he's told, oh, you know, we've seen the risen Lord. And he says, oh, I'm not going to believe that. Well, why does he say that? Because he's been burned too many times. He's afraid to, he's afraid to believe. He's afraid to love. This is all based on the exact same pattern of the divine twin and the mortal twin. And in fact, there's there are some Gnostic gospels that didn't that got excluded from the canon. In one of those, Jesus says to Thomas, Jesus is always having dialogues with Thomas. He says, Thomas, I don't want you to be ignorant of who you are. There are many people who don't even know of the divine nature. He says, Thomas, let me explain to you. I am your twin. You're my twin. So 
is like I was saying, a lot of people don't even realize they have a higher self. Or if you start talking about the higher self, the essential self, the authentic self, their golem mind will laugh at you because it's like, <laughs> I don't want to hear about that. Hmm. I don't want to believe that I've been divided from who I am. It's too painful. The golem self wants to suppress the authentic self because the golem self got divided from the authentic self because of trauma. Being connected to the authentic self was painful for some reason. So the, the, the egoic mind wants to deny that there's even such thing as a higher self. And you see that in the story mm. of, of doubting Thomas. So, so that's, uh, I, you were asking, I think Graham, you said, can you show some myths that talk about that? Well, Sorry. yeah, actually, well, I do have a question before I forget. Uh, um, the, have you ever looked into, have you heard of the myths of um, Dionysos and Bacchus who were resurrected on March 25th, both of them? And does that have anything to do with this trauma at all? Yeah, so Dionysus is a super important god. And Bacchus is, is the uh, Roman, that's the name is used more in Roman, but it's the same god. But you're right, there are actually, there's, there's actually, uh, there's a, a, a Dionysus who is burned up there, Dionysus goes through not just one resurrection, but actually two different resurrections. Okay. He's torn limb from limb by uh, his brothers. He's, the, the name Dionysus, it's really interesting, actually means Zeus, Dios of Nysos. Nysos, the mountain of okay. Nysos. Yeah. So Dionysus is the Zeus of the mountain of Nysos. And Dionysus is actually the son of Zeus. But um, once again, it's not... Zeus is married to the goddess Hera. That's his main consort. That's his main wife, if you will. But he's always having affairs. And so in, uh, in, in the birth of, of Dionysus, it's the, uh, the beautiful Semele or Semele. Um, Zeus becomes enamored with her. And, and so they have an affair. And then she says, hey, I want to see you in all your glory. Can I see you in all your glory? please. And there's actually a parallel of this in the Bible where Moses asked to see God in all his glory. But um, Zeus says, that would be a bad idea. You cannot see me in all my glory. It'll burn you up. And she goes, no, I insist. Actually, I think Hera, um, in the story, Hera finds out about the affair, goes to Sem Semele and says, hey, is it true that you're with child by Zeus himself, the very god of the thunderbolt. Is that true? And Semele says, yes. The, the child I carry inside me is going to be the son of Zeus. And Hera in disguise says, I don't think that's possible that he's really Zeus. Another, the doubt motif is there again. Why don't you ask him to show himself in all his divine glory as the, the Lord of Olympus? Why don't you ask him to show Show him in that, show himself in that form. Then you'll know for sure if you're really married to Zeus. And Similia goes, okay, <laughs> I didn't think of that. And so she starts pestering Zeus and saying, you know, I'm wondering if you could show me yourself in your true glory. And he says, bad idea. Don't ask that. You couldn't, you couldn't handle it. And, but the doubt has taken over her mind. And she says, come on, I, I want to know if you're really Zeus. And he says, listen, I'm really Zeus. <laughs> and she says, I don't believe it until I see it. And he, so he chooses like the smallest possible thundercloud and the smallest possible lightning bolt. And he shows himself in all his glory. And she's immediately burned to ashes. And the child inside of her uh, would have been burned to ashes, but he's the divine Dionysus. So that's like his first um, resurrection, kind first of. death. Yeah. yeah. And Zeus actually sows Dionysus inside of his own thigh. And then Dionysus is born. Uh, after the full nine months is born out of Zeus's thigh, which is, wow. which is interesting. And it has a celestial component. It's all, this is all celestial yeah. um, as well. So then the Titans are, I think are the ones who are jealous of him next and they tear him limb from limb, which has to do with the constellation that he's associated with. And then he's resurrected again. So Dionysus has uh, definite patterns that, have some similarities to Jesus. And actually, if you look at depictions of Dionysus, he typically has the flowing hair and beard and um, youthful looks. And he's a God of wine and Jesus turns water to wine. 
there's a, there's a lot of parallels throughout all the uh, myths of the ancient world. But I don't know if that addresses your question. Yeah, yeah, or not. yeah, yeah. What about Bacchus? Yeah. Well, so Bacchus is the the Roman name. There's actually a name for the uh, Dionysus before he gets torn limb from limb, and then he becomes Dionysus. And I can't remember what that name is off the top of my head. I think it starts with a Z. But um, Bacchus is another name for Dionysus. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, but he but keeps there coming are different Bacchus. aspects. But the, yeah. <laughs> Good one. I give that one a, a 7.2. <laughs> yeah. um, mm. the, uh, the, uh, there are different aspects of Dionysus, like as a jolly kind of really drunk, you know, not, not as youthful looking, more corpulent. That's how Bacchus is often depicted. So, um, like jolly Bacchus riding on a donkey a lot of times, um, hanging out with satyrs who are, yeah, yeah. right? So uh, in that aspect of Bacchus, so Dionysus has a lot of different aspects. In fact, in one aspect, he's even horned Dionysus is almost like a head on top of a, a river uh, serpent. Um, and in, in, in that way, he's actually associated with Moses because wow. Moses is sometimes depicted with horns. So, uh, yeah, Dionysus is a super important God. I mean, he's the Zeus of the mountain Nisus. So, you know, that he's a, he's an extremely important, he's an extremely important God. If he's a Zeus, right? He's Dios, the same word Dios that we get the same word Dios that is the word for God in Spanish is the same word as is in the name Dionysus or Dios Nisos. And it's related to the name Zeus. Dios, if you t- turn the D into kind of a Z, it becomes Zeus. Zeus. Yeah, yeah. A it's Zeus related. is real close to Jesus too. That's right. It's it's also close to uh, the divine name of God in the, in the Bible, uh, Jehovah. Yeah. Jove, Jove, uh, which is, Zeus Pater or Jupiter is the is the Latin name, which is also Jove, which is related to Jehovah or Yahweh. Yahweh with a the W could be pronounced as a V. That Yo Yahweh is very close to Jove as well. So um, actually, all these most powerful divine figures are related to the same constellations across myth systems what about adonis same kind of question for adonis yeah so adonis actually uh, is uh i think associated with a different constellation sagittarius uh he's a he's a shepherd um i don't have any i've got some pictures so let me actually zeus is associated with hercules and i've shown this a little bit before but how are we doing on time what, what how long have you been going uh, about an hour and a half, I think, so yeah, far, a little so, bit less. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've been talking a lot about how these myths are actually metaphors for what we're going through. Okay, I'm not saying that the these gods are not real. I believe they're very real. I believe the divine realm is very real, and I believe we reconnect with it or we connect with it through our higher self. Um, so uh, I believe you can find these kinds of uh, ways back to connect with who you really are through the scriptures of the Bible, through the scriptures of the Vedas and the sacred texts of ancient India, through the myths of, of, that were given to all the different cultures of the world. Um, I don't believe that they're not real, but I I'm convinced that they're based on celestial metaphor because the stars are in this infinite realm. So they use the stars to teach us about the invisible realm. Like if I said, Hey, what is, what does my higher self look like? You know, if I was talking to a, a wise guru, who's going to teach me how to reconnect with my higher self. And I go up to the top of the mountain, he starts teaching me to meditate. And one day I say, Hey, you know, so I can recognize my higher self. What does he look like or she look like, or what does my higher self look like? The, the, the teacher would probably slap me and say, you knucklehead, you're looking in the wrong direction. <laughs> Your higher self is not 
a physical entity. And I say, yeah, but but wait, my higher self sometimes is portrayed as Isis or as Osiris or as uh, Jesus or as, yeah, but that's to teach you how to reconnect with your higher self. Oh, does that mean that uh, the divine realm isn't real? You'd probably slap me again and say, no, of course not. The divine realm is real. You just can't see it. So the way I'm going to help you understand it is through these myths are going to point you towards these are realities, but they're using the infinite realm of the stars to teach us those realities. And it can be proven to be a metaphor because all these myths are can be shown to be based on the stars. So I've shown some connections to Hercules before, but it's good because we were just talking about Zeus and the connection to other divine figures that are very powerful. Um, this is Hercules again. Can you, and I've, I, I've, I think I've shown this on Grand America before, but just for people that maybe this is their first time seeing me talk and hopefully, you know, they might say, oh, that metaphor stuff is very interesting, but how do you know it's, how do you know it's really that? Well, I can show you that these myths are based on the stars. They are using celestial metaphor. And here's an outline of Hercules from, or Heracles from an ancient Greek uh, pottery. He's fighting in a battle here. You can see he's got his arm up over his head. You can see a sword way up there. If you look the, the pot that it's painted on his curve, but he's got this huge sword over his head. He's got one, leg forward and one leg back, one arm forward. And if you look at the outline of Hercules that I put up there, that's the constellation Hercules. The hero Heracles is almost invariably drawn in that outline, that same, that same posture that matches up with the constellations. Here's, here's a, this is a different myth where Heracles or Hercules is stealing, he's actually stealing the tripod from the temple of Delphi <laughs> And you can see that exaggerated lunge again. You see that exaggerated lunge in his, his, uh, his posture? He's actually being chased by the god Apollo. Apollo, you can see he's got a quiver of arrows at his side. That's Apollo is related to a different constellation, actually Sagittarius, that, that you asked about, hmm. Graham, when you were asking about Adonis. Yeah. Um, Adonis... All these constellations can play a male character or a female character. Sagittarius plays female characters a lot of times and a lot of times plays male characters so adonis is kind of a um you know a youth who's got a lot of physical beauty not like rugged looking like hercules and um a lot of times doesn't have a beard so you see apollo so um adonis sometimes actually gets castrated in some of the myths by a boar or um you know, the, 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 the stories when you're like, what, what is going on in these stories? They seem so, uh, they seem so bizarre. Zeus sews up a uh, baby Dionysus in his leg and then gives birth to him. That's because Dionysus is associated with the constellation that's right below Heracles, Ophiuchus. That's how he gets torn limb from limb. You can see the, the serpent halves on either side. Um, huh. He's born from the thigh of Zeus. Or Athena is born out of the head of Zeus. Athena is also associated with Ophiuchus. But in this case, Hercules is running off with a tripod at the temple of Delphi. What do you think constellation could play the tripod that Hercules is trying to run away with? It's actually <sighs> Ophiuchus right there. It's, it's Ophiuchus right below. Is that what, see, what's Ophiuchus stepping on? He's stepping on Scorpio, and that plays a role in a lot of myths, but actually, um, to the left of Ophiuchus is Sagittarius. Sagittarius is on the other side of the Milky Way from Scorpio. That's um, Apollo is associated with Sagittarius. I didn't draw it in on this one. I should have, but the tripod of Ophiuchus in this case is in between Hercules, the constellation, and Sagittarius, the constellation. And that's why we have this myth of Hercules and Apollo having a tug of war over the tripod of the temple at Delphi. I think it looks, it could be interpreted as looking like a tripod. It, Ophiuchus plays a role of a lot of different uh, 
figure is a myth. Some, sometimes it's a mountain. That's why it's Zeus of the mountain or Dionysus is associated with Ophiuchus. Is there something else about him taking the oracle away from that? Or is that tripod something to do with yeah, the tripod future is telling? The oracle. Or, oh, yeah, oh, is it? Okay. that's right. And yeah. it's right there next to the Milky Way. You can see kind of some smoky stuff on the left side of the uh, left side of that constellation yeah, image yeah, there. Yeah. That's the Milky Way. I've inverted the sky so that the background of the sky, which would be dark, is light. And everything that's uh, everything on this image is inverted. So the Milky Way, which is really bright in the sky, looks like cloudy smoke. So that's the smoke that floats up next to the tripod that puts the priestess, her name is the, the, the Pythia. Uh, she's, she's the priestess of Delphi. She's uh, the the smoke is rising up from the body of Python that Apollo s slew the dragon Python. The dragon Python is almost certainly associated with Scorpio that's down there beneath the tripod. Huh. Does that make sense? Yep. But what I'm really trying to show is I, I'm getting uh, getting off into some other myths, but I'm really trying to show the connection between Hercules and the constellation Hercules. You can see the artist using those same uh, constellation patterns in the art. Here's Zeus. So Zeus is the father of Hercules. This is an, uh, an ancient vase showing Zeus. He's got his arm raised overhead with the uh, thunderbolt. He's about to battle with Typhon. Typhon is, on, is to the right. But since it's a little bit damaged, it's hard to tell. But if you look, he's into that same deep lunging posture. But some of the paint has flaked off. But can you see how his back leg is bent mm -hmm. off to the left of your screen there? Yep. Here's a depiction of what it used to look like. Wow. Can you see that that's the same posture as the constellation Hercules? It's got quite the bubble butt there. Yeah, he's, he's it's like you. powerful. Yeah, he Look could he could bench press like five thousand pounds. And, and, and Typhon, Typhon's a pretty important. Uh, the, I don't know what, what's the right word. I mean, the one of yeah. the all pervading. Uh, what what would you even call it? Monster, demon, whatever. Archetype right. it has, right? And see how he's got legs made out of snakes? Yeah. So look at Ophiuchus carefully, directly below Hercules. Yeah. See how Ophiuchus is a, a central body with two serpents on either side and then two legs at the bottom? Yep. Okay. He, Ophiuchus means serpent holder. So Ophiuchus shows up in myth in many different guises, but put your fingers over the bottom put your finger over the bottom legs and just look at the central body. And then you've got a serpent coming out to the left and a serpent coming out to the right. Yeah. That's the serpent legs of Typhon. Typhon is associated with Ophiuchus. I'm pretty convinced because Hercules actually finally deals with Typhon. He can't completely destroy Typhon. He throws thunderbolts at Typhon. He can, wound Typhon and drive him back, but he can't completely slay him. So he slams, you know how he deals with him? I can't he slams remember. a mountain down on top of him. Wow. In, in some, uh, some traditions, it's Mount Etna, which is still a volcano in, in Italy today. So he slams Mount Etna down on top of Typhon. And that's, you can see Ophiuchus sometimes plays a mountain in different myths. So anyway, but if you, if you look at Ophiuchus, you can realize why it's a figure with two snakes for legs, just like the image of Starbucks. If you go to Starbucks, you see the, uh, the siren, the, mer the mermaid or the siren, and she's got two fishy uh, tails coming up, just like Typhon here, hmm. because she's associated with Ophiuchus. I would argue she's associated with Ophiuchus. This is another uh, figure who's associated with Hercules. That's, you know who that is? No. Hanuman. Hanuman from oh. ancient India. They're still worshipped in India. From the ancient Sanskrit texts of India. The, the god Hanuman is, I am convinced, associated with the constellation Hercules. You can see what's Hanuman's chosen weapon. A huge mace. Oh, I was, I was looking at the rock. Yeah, so he's picking up a rock with his other hand. So he's got a mace in one hand, and he's picking up a mountain in the other hand. Ophiuchus, like I said, is plays the role of a mountain. In this one particular myth, 
Hanuman has to save somebody's life, and he's told, uh, "Hey, the only way to save this this person." Uh, is to get this herb that grows on in the mountains of the Himalayas. You've got to go get this herb. And Hanuman gets there and he's looking around and he's like, I'm not sure which herb it is. Okay, I'll bring the whole mountain. So he brings the whole mountain. Well, that myth, you can see Hercules figures are above a mountain. He's leaning down and picking up either the triangular top of Ophiuchus or that little serpent head of Ophiuchus, the little smaller triangle there. You see that? Yeah. This is a picture of, uh, this is a gate in India. This is carved in the 1500s, but this is a figure whose name is Beam in the Sanskrit myths. He's got a big mace, but you can see how he's in that exact same uh, posture of Hercules. Beam is kind of a Hercules figure, Bhima. It's spelled Bhima, B-H-I-M-A. They usually pronounce it Beam, but you can see how it's connected to the Hercules figures across different cultures are often connected to the same kind of characteristics. They're usually jovial, they're pretty uh, fun-loving, they love to eat and party, but they have a quick temper, all these same kinds of things. And you can see he's holding up a lotus flower in one hand. That's because that part of Ophiuchus sometimes plays a lotus flower. Sometimes actually a lotus flower coming out of the belly button of an Ophiuchus figure. In fact, this is a this is a uh, this is a picture of Vishnu churning the ocean of milk. Vishnu is associated with Ophiuchus. Uh, Vishnu has a, a a lotus coming out of his navel in some of the ancient Sanskrit texts, and you can see above there, above Vishnu is another deity. That's Indra. That's associated with Indra. And Indra is the god who carries the thunderbolt in ancient India in the Sanskrit texts. And Indra, again, is associated with Hercules. So Hercules figures usually have the thunderbolt. Can you see how Indra is depicted in the outline of Hercules? Yep. Same thing with the back leg. and Yeah. yeah. And actually, if you look closely, all these dancing figures, both on the left and the right, I'm not even sure if they're male figures or female figures. They look like they're probably female figures because they have breasts, bare breasts, but they might be, they're like, uh, they're like, um, angels or devas in, uh, there are many different, there's Gandharvas, there's many different, uh, classes of celestial beings in the Sanskrit epics, but you can see they have a crown on their head. Just make note of that crown. It's important because there's a crown next to Hercules too, but you see they're in that same posture too. Uh, Thor is associated with, uh, Hercules. Here's a god from Africa. His name is Shango or Shango. He's also a thunder god. So Thor is a thunder god. Shango is a thunder god. Zeus, Zeus is obviously, yes, a thunder god. So Zeus has a hammer. Uh, Zeus has a thunderbolt. Indra has a thunderbolt. Sometimes it's called the Vajra. Um, Shango has an axe, but they're all related to the, the constellation outline. Here's from the Americas. This is from a Maya text. You see how that figure there looks like he's holding a thunderbolt? This is from a Maya codex, the oldest known Maya codex. Um, look at the similarities to Zeus. Except he's facing the wrong way. Is that from the seven? Yeah, okay, he's facing the wrong way. But still, it's they they sometimes the Greek paintings are facing the other way too. They uh they actually take Kind of artistic license but you can see they're still using that same um hercules outline and the thunderbolt is associated with hercules figures would you agree yeah it makes sense because the thunderbolt i mean that triangle or that uh weird yeah, shape above weapon, there, it could yeah right? it looks like it could be like either a hammer or a thunderbolt or yeah. it could be it yeah. could play a club yeah like hercules's favorite weapon is usually a club yeah now here's a really interesting one this is from the, the, it's called the, the Gate of the Sun or the Puerta del Sol. That's what we call it today. It's from Tiwanaku in Bolivia. We don't know what the ancient people who built this called it, but look at that figure and look at the figures all, all around. I would argue that that is an Ophiuchus figure, this pattern of holding two serpents or two 
objects on either side. And then all around him are these little flying figures that are in the Hercules posture. You see how those are those two constellations? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That is from an ancient monument at Tiwanaku. We don't even know, you know, who built it. Uh, it's maybe it was Inca, maybe it was Toltec or Olmec, but this ancient culture in the Americas is using this same system that's found around the world. And they seem to be it's, highlighting Ophiuchus or whatever his name is there. Do you think that's for a specific reason? Ophiuchus is the gate. Ophiuchus is the portal. So this is on the gate of the sun. I'll go back. Let Jeez. me see if I can. It, Ophiuchus is the gate. And so Ophiuchus is our connection to the divine realm. I talk about that in my latest book. So Zeus figures are in the divine realm. Ophiuchus figures often connect us to the divine realm. That's our gate to, to connect to the divine realm. So Ophiuchus is super important. Um, what I'm highlighting here is the some of the other constellations around Hercules. There's Hercules there. And can you see the northern crown? It's right next to Hercules. I just labeled it. Yep. Right there. You can see that tonight. And we'll see that when we go to Bryce Canyon. We'll see Hercules. We'll see Ophiuchus. Well, Hercules figures are sometimes envisioned as reaching out and grasping the northern crown. Or remember, we saw in that carving from India, sometimes there's uh, Hercules figures that are depicted as wearing a crown. Well, this, this uh, idea of grasping something that's curved like that actually shows up. This is a, a Bible story from the uh, book of Kings, First Kings. This is the famous judgment of Solomon. I don't know if I've shown it to you guys before. No, I don't think so. Can you see anyone who's holding a sword kind of over his back, like a strong Hercules kind of figure? Yeah, the guy on those right there. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the story of the judgment of Solomon, where Solomon's wisdom is is shown. These two women have two babies at the same time. Once again, we have a, a two babies being born at the same time. But one of the babies dies and one of the babies lives. A similar pattern to what we were talking about. Can you see the dead baby down on the ground? Yeah. Okay. And they're actually, they're two harlots in the Bible, or two prostitutes. Uh, they both get pregnant at the same time. One of them overlays the baby and the baby dies. And then, um, so they come before the king and one of them says, Oh, king, uh, she switched babies on me. My baby was born, her baby was born about the same time. Then she actually accidentally uh, overlay the baby, slept on the baby, baby died. And then she switched with mine. And that's, and she gave me the dead one and she took my baby. And, and the other one says, no, 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 that's not true. I didn't do that. She's trying to trick you, O king. This, the dead baby is hers. The live baby is mine. And Solomon says, hmm, this is a dilemma. How do I know whose baby is whose? So he says, I've got an idea. Take the live baby, cut it in half, give one half to each of them, solves the problem. <laughs> and immediately one of the women yells out, oh, no, 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 give it to her. I don't care. Please don't kill that baby. And the other one says, oh, no, I think you should. Cut it up. Now, that's irrational, right? <laughs> the one who was trying to get the baby, who had lied about it, says, no, I want you to cut it in half anyway. Now, just a minute ago, she was trying to keep the baby as a live baby. So it doesn't even, it's, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor about the, the same thing we were talking about, the higher self and the lower self, the, the dead baby, the live baby, the, the egoic mind and the divine mind. But th this is, Solomon immediately says, stop, don't cut the baby in half. That was just a trick. Give it to her. The one, the one who said, the one who said, "Don't kill it." That's obviously the mother. Uh, give it to her. So, and that's in First uh, Kings three, chapter uh, chapter three, verse sixteen, and following there. Hmm. But you, can you see how the in in the text itself, Solomon says, "Cut the baby in half." It's not. When I was a kid, I thought it was Solomon wielding the sword. It's not Solomon wielding the sword. He's telling someone to wield the sword. You see the how the baby is arched right yep. there? 
hard arch. In these myths, a Hercules figure will often pick up a baby. And the baby is the northern crown. Now, that doesn't just jump out at you as a baby, but it's found around the world this way, which is an argument for this system is connected. This is not like, uh, uh, this is not something that just pops up um, randomly in different cultures all by itself. I believe there's an ancient worldwide system that is remembered by all these different cultures around the world. Here's another depiction of the judgment of Solomon. Solomon saying, hold on, don't cut it in half. See, once again, we have the, the swordsman putting the sword over his back and the baby, once again, depicted in an arch. Oh, yeah. And huh. Solomon, Solomon is often depicted, he's described as being between the pillars of the temple. Um, oh, I jumped ahead a little bit, but Solomon is a different constellation. He's not Hercules. Okay. But I just want to show real quick, and I know we're, we're, I'm not giving you guys a lot of time to ask questions. No, no, it's okay. Constellations. Sometimes I get this uh, response. Well, of course, all the myths around the world are based on the stars because you can see the stars around the world, right? Yep. Which you can. But the constellation Hercules is not an obvious constellation. And even when you know how to find the constellation Hercules, to imagine the northern crown as a baby is not particularly obvious. I mean, we, we already saw the northern crown, right? And yet we see it here as a baby. We see it in the myths of Maui. Maui is thrown into the uh, ocean foam by his parents. And uh, he's rescued by his powerful grandfather who picks him up and hangs him in the rafters over the fire to dry out because he's freezing cold from being thrown into the ocean. That's the same pattern. The grandfather is Hercules. The baby, Maui in this case, who's being lifted up to the rafters is, in that case, the, the constellation uh, Corona Borealis, Northern Crown, same word that we use for coronavirus right now, which you see that in these kind of traumatic operations. I think that there are people who are using uh, the ancient knowledge to inflict trauma instead of to help us to uh, overcome trauma. But mm. it's not an obvious thing to see the baby, to see the Northern Crown, Corona Borealis, as a baby. And yet we find it around the world. We find it in the Bible. We also find it in the, uh, the book of Revelation, not, not only in the book of First Kings, which is in the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament. We also find it in the Revelation, the Greek scriptures of the New Testament. We find it in the myths of Maui. It is not obvious. And even here's a depiction of the constellation Hercules from the 1800s. Notice that this artist, the artist's name is Sidney Hall. You can find this. This is from a, a famous book of the constellations. It's actually flashcards of the constellations made in the early 1800s. I think the 1820s, wow. maybe the 1840s. Well, you can see they've got the posture of Hercules, right? He's got the deep knee bend, right? He's got the club over his head, right? Yeah. But they've got it wrong because you see the crown. It's on the other There's side. The yeah. They've got it upside down. They, the, the, the outline of Hercules is understood, but in this, in this uh, set of cards that they made in the 1800s, they've actually outlined Hercules upside down. The northern crown is over there. Yeah, yeah. This is the outline of Hercules. I just, I just drew it. Yeah. That's not, that's not part of the card series. I drew that in. That's the way Hercules is in that deep knee bend. But it's not so obvious. It's, it's so not obvious that they didn't even get it right. They knew that it's supposed to be that way because of somehow the traditions get passed down. Artists even you know those paintings that I showed you of Judgment of Solomon, those aren't ancient. That's getting passed down through the ages to depict these figures in these postures. And, and here's another clue. The star Vega, that's a very bright star. You see the star Vega is over on that side. So they've clearly got Hercules drawn upside down. Yeah. <clears throat> Interesting. So so that that defeats the argument of, oh, it'd be so obvious that all these different cultures, they just come up with the same myths. Uh, because they're looking at the same stars. Right. They're using the same system. 
it's an ancient system, but somehow the system has been lost, possibly because of a cataclysm like Randall talks about or other people like Robert Schock talk about. This system was already in place during the time of the ancient Egyptians, during the time of ancient Mesopotamia. We could show it from the Gilgamesh and from other Sumerian myths. It was already in place in the ancient India Vedas, ancient China. It was in place in the most ancient civilizations we know about, the ancient Maya, the Toltecs, the whoever built Tiwanaku. It was already worldwide at the time of the most ancient civilizations. What does that tell you? It probably came from something even earlier. Yeah. Probably much earlier. Yeah. So, um, but it's, but it, but it's apparently one of its main purposes is to help us to reconnect with our higher self and through that reconnect with the realm of the gods, the realm of our pure potential or our, our, our potential. So I've talked a lot. I'll let you guys ask questions. I'll unshare the screen if you want. Well, you mentioned, you mentioned a couple of times there about, about them using, instead of using myths to heal, you're, they're using myths to traumatize us right now. So have, after looking at all this and bringing out this book in 2020 about trauma and with everything that's going on right now, I mean, can you, can you, is there any examples you have of them using symbolism yeah. or mythology to, to traumatize us? Yeah. And you can think of some too, without much Without much uh, prompting, you well, can think I mean, of them. Well, there's the I'll, whole I'll masking. There's the whole esoteric part of masking people. I mean, that's one thing. But I don't know what I don't. I I see these things contemporarily, but I don't have enough knowledge of the myths to to correlate them to any kind of esoteric yeah. symbology. Or well, let like me that. get into let me get into it just briefly. I do get into it in the book. So, oh, okay, wow. I do get into it in the book, which you you guys are getting, but. This is another painting of the uh, Judgment of Solomon. You can see the uh, dead baby in yeah. one his arms and the live baby is again arching. Look at Solomon in this case. He's got some hand gestures. So these hand gestures tie into constellations, by the way. Um, you see that at, like in the uh, Last Supper uh, painting. But you see that Solomon is very often associated with the two pillars of the temple. You see the two pillars yep. there? The two pillars with Solomon in between. Two pillars with Solomon in between. So this is a famous screenshot from a BBC broadcast from what? Before Tower 7 went down. Talking about Tower Correct. 7. So how many towers went down in the World Trade Center Three. attacks? Three towers. Two towers with <laughs> the Solomon Brothers building in between. The 47-story Solomon Brothers building is right behind her. She's saying that it's collapsed. She's a half an hour early. Somehow she's been told, hey, you got to announce that the Solomon Brothers building is going down. Building 7 is which also is, known it's, as the Which is weird that Solomon they would make Brothers that mistake. Building. I mean, that, that to me is... It's not, weird unless they're putting it in your face. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. L listen, what have we been talking about with trauma? What is trauma? What is trauma? You have to disconnect from what you're... The rest of you is telling your, your goal of mind that is your defense mechanism, this egoic mind that keeps you alive, it believes it's keeping you alive. It's like, I saved us. I got us through all that. It doesn't want to let go. You've got a much wider consciousness than your consciousness, uh, than your, your goal of egoic mind. You've got, you've got a gut. You've got a higher self that's telling you stuff with through synchronicity sometimes through yeah. messages through dreams yeah. through it's intuition yeah. and yet our world causes us to divide from that if your gut is telling you if you watch those buildings come down and then you're told they came down because of fires that were caused by planes and yet and your your egoic mind goes yes i believe that Deep down in your heart, deep down in your gut, there's parts of you that are very, very wise that are picking up on all kinds of signals that you're not picking up on that's going, that is complete bullshit. That is not what caused those towers to come down, especially building seven. Yeah. Some, some, some office fire didn't bring down a 47 story steel frame building yeah. into its footprint at free fall speed or at speeds that are indistinguishable from free fall. So anyone who sees that, deep down knows, but you suppress that because if you go to work and start talking about it, 
you're going to get cut off from your source of livelihood. Just like that quotation I gave you. I don't know if Dr. Mate agrees with a single thing that I say. So please don't, please don't uh, misinterpret this as me saying that he supports my, my no, interpretations no, 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 of no. things. But he said that as a child, you must have nurturing from your parents. So you will suppress parts of yourself. You will disconnect because you cannot get, you must get that nourishment. Well, we do the same thing. We cannot, nobody can completely disconnect from society. If you go try and live in solitary confinement, it'll be very hard on you. If you live on an island for 30 years all by yourself, the minute somebody shows up, you'll, you'll be hugging them and dancing. We are social animals. So we cannot uh, uh, just run around talking about what we know. Our, our egoic mind has been created all through middle school, all through elementary school to protect us from uh, being completely excluded and shunned. And well, so we divide from ourselves. And that I think what's going on is you've got some people who have woken up to this and are starting to run around looking for all these symbols and like, aha, aha. And then you have some people who are suppressing it. But yeah. in both cases, it's traumatizing. Yeah, it's also it's traumatizing fun. to be stuck inside your house too, and not to and to social distance. Absolutely, I mean, this is a whole other other part of the trauma that you just talked about. About you can't, you know, you talked about isolation. Well, they're actually forcing people to do that now. Absolutely, and and so, and and then when they do it with symbolism, look, the two towers and the Solomon Brothers building. Yeah, wow, that is a and and in the book I talk about. Um, the the there's these patterns are used to to where people go ooh i'm starting to look for those patterns it's almost an initiation okay it's almost an initiation but it's not an initiation into reconnecting with your higher self it's more of an initiation into oh my goodness the these all powerful uh you know I, I use the terms from like the military, like, I, you know, I, I was in the military, I went to West Point, they call it the cadre, or the drill instructors, if you're going through basic training, you're getting an initiation. If you go to basic training, you get an initiation. If you go to West Point, you get an initiation. And guess what is traumatic. Yeah. <laughs> and the cadre, or the drill instructors, the, the ones who are at the top of the pyramid, are, it's almost like they're gods in your eyes. So you're getting an initiation, but it's not an initiation into uh, I'm connected to my higher self. I'm so powerful. It's more of an initiation into ah the the people above me are so powerful they can do anything. That's <laughs> that's the kind of that's the kind of effect that I think they're going for by putting this stuff in your face. That's some people yeah. some people are some people suppress it, and that's traumatic. It's just like if your wife I use this. Uh, metaphor i heard it from someone else actually who said if your wife is cheating on you you'll actually know it deep inside before your brain admits it mm. or if your girlfriend your significant other because your your uh your your most um i'm trying to stop share here your most deepest all, Intu all, intuition yeah intuition your subconscious knows it but your your golem mind your egoic mind that's trying to protect you and i know we're running out of time keeps you from knowing it. and then eventually when you know reality crashes in maybe you, your egoic mind finally has to deal with it but that being separated from what you know that's what that's what's happening i think with some of these traumatic events where it's so blatant and and you're looking at it and going how is anyone believing that that event is really what they're telling it? Yeah, yeah. As yeah. Well, I think there's a lot of people who are realizing that subconsciously, but they're suppressing it, and that's unhealthy. So we've got we're creating more and more of a traumatic society because it's easier to oppress people when they're split from who they are. If you're a integrated with who you are, you're completely. Like you were raised in that environment that we were talking about earlier, where you know exactly who you, you know, you're, you're part of your tribe. Your dad was always showing you things. You don't feel self-conscious of the way you dress or the way you talk. You're, 
you're hanging out with lots of other kids your age, you're learning to hunt, you're learning to read the leaves of this kind of plant and that kind of plant, you're going to be a lot more of a, a dignified, connected, powerful kind of an individual and, uh, than if you're obliterated. And so when, whenever literalist Christianity goes somewhere to try and expand its empire, it immediately starts stamping out all the ancient knowledge that was there saying, you can't, you can't, you can't listen to those myths. They're demonic and you can't talk in your language. We're going to put you in this school where you talk in this language. We're going to divide you from your culture on purpose because uh, it, it, it's, it's an attempt to obliterate that cohesion and that power. And actually we're in a culture that where every single one of us, that, you know, your ancestors were not literalist Christians. No, nobody's was. Every, that was that was in placed onto onto every everybody's ancestors at some point, whether you're from Europe or from Africa or from Asia or from the Americas. That was not an original set of myths that was given to people. It's built on ancient stuff. I'm not saying that the Bible cannot help you. It can. It's it's wonderful. But the system that was put on top of it is often traumatizing. So. And that's why so many people, I think, are so hungry for, oh, I want to go learn the myths of India, or I want to learn the sacred traditions of the Native American sacred traditions. They're hungry for that because they're like, I want to get back to that. I want to get integrated with my authentic self somehow. And they and they see that as a path to do it, which it is a path to do it. So do you think there's a risk that with all this overt symbolism and hypocrisy that they will overstep or overshoot the mark and a whole bunch of people will wake up that they don't expect. I mean, isn't it going to take only a certain amount of people like the hundredth monkey kind of thing before everybody realizes, Oh my God, like, I hope a lot of people wake up to it. I, I, I absolutely think that the, the people are more powerful than the small group, <laughs> right? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's inflicting trauma on people. And that's why they have to use deception. <laughs> if you're more powerful, you don't have to use deception. Yeah, yeah. So I hope that people will wake up. And and I think that getting in touch, getting reconnected with your own self is is a really important first step. But I th- that's why I put both in this book. And you know, it it's a, it's a lot to try and hold together in one book. But I felt like it was important to have both those aspects: the reconnecting with yourself but also realizing what's going on on a societal level. Cause I think we're getting to a point where we really need, it's getting very dangerous. This, this whole lockdown. I mean, um, we can all see that something is going on beyond what we're being told. Okay. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, put down yeah, people yeah, who are yeah. wearing masks yeah. or people who aren't wearing masks. Like if you're on a native American reservation where there's really bad outbreaks of COVID, uh, wearing a mask might be the right thing to do. I saw a picture of Superman today with a mask. I'm not going to insult yeah, that, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, but we can see that something is going on that is manipulation. I mean, there's no, there's no doubt in your mind when they're sending sick people to nursing homes. You're like, what in, on earth are they doing? Are they trying to kill more people? What? There, it's like it doesn't compute unless there's something else going on. And I don't think there's anybody listening who uh, who wouldn't agree that there's something more going on. Yeah. Well, why are they doing it? It could be to be increasing uh, technological surveillance of everybody, kinds of things that nobody would have accepted a year ago. Yeah. yeah. Now we're going to trace wherever you go and people say, oh, thank you. As long as I can get on an airplane and now we're going to fly drones above cities you know, to, to monitor uh, any gathering. You know, oh, yeah, I think we need to do that. Uh, ushering in, ushering in AI to uh, do more facial recognition. I don't know exactly what's going on, but the, the, the capabilities to impose greater austerity on people are increasing. And I think the imposition of austerity, I talk about this in the book too, I don't have time to really get into it, but austerity basically means higher taxes and lower services. Yeah. <laughs> you get yeah. less and you pay more. Yeah. And it's not always government taxes. In fact, it's a lot of times it's private 
tax, like a tax that's imposed by the bank, a tax that's imposed by the corporation, yeah, yeah. Pri- private equity buying up all the parking meters in a city. This is actually happening where cities are broke and bankrupt and they have to sell off the roads to some Wall Street investor who says, oh yeah, I'd love to get all the quarters or all the parking tolls. We're not going to use quarters anymore. You're going to use your credit card, but that's a private tax. It's going into a private billionaire's pocket instead of going to, you know, the government that's supposed to be of the people, by the people, for the people. Yeah. Um, anyway, a private tax. So that's austerity. So that's what I think is being imposed. Uh, so I think we better wake up to well, I think, answer to your question. And I think part of the the lesson here probably would be, especially with you, your book and, and the other people we've talked to is to try and try and get to that point where you're, you can bring out your authentic self. And, and then I think that the truth is more discernible. It's easier. It's easier. It's easier discernible. How do I say it? Yeah. It's more easily discernible. I think if you're in, your authentic easily self. I mean, yeah, I really I totally do. Agree. I really do believe I think that, we're on, that there's a, I think there's we're a, on that journey. Yeah, I totally yeah. agree with you. I, and I'm not saying, Oh, I'm, you know, look at me. I'm, totally in touch with my higher self, but I do see like this authentic self part of me has been leading me on this journey. Cause this is all this stuff that I just talked about is not something I was looking at, yeah. looking for yeah. when I was in the army or even yeah. when I got out of the army, I was taking the Bible. Literally I was a literalist Christian, but something started moving me down this path. Yeah. So yeah. I totally agree that, that we, uh, we will discern more the more we, get in touch. Like yeah. And I, and I don't, and I think you're pretty open. You say that you don't, you don't necessarily know the truth. And I don't think we do either. I'm not saying that we know the truth, but maybe, you know, what's not true. You know, maybe that's the way to look at it as discernible, discerning the lies as opposed to, you know, knowing the truth. Yeah. There's a totally. big difference. And seeing there. patterns yeah. and seeing these patterns, like this book came out in April before some of the crazy stuff that happened in May, but those patterns, a lot of these patterns, you, you've probably seen some of my videos talking about what is this pattern of cross legs with this guy who got pushed down yeah. in Buffalo? And by the way, there's an obelisk right over here or an obelisk. And oh, look at this building, two towers with a thing. And, you know, yeah. you see this, the pattern of greater austerity has been going on for a long time since the middle ages, really. Yeah. So yeah. that w- this book hopefully will help people see patterns, which looking at constellations is seeing patterns. Yeah. So that's right on. Well, right on, Dave. Fun. Uh, we can't wait to look at some patterns with you. And I guess what would only be really like five months from now, four months from now, we're gonna see and we're gonna see a couple times. You yeah, know what I'm I was really thinking is months. why don't you just come up here, come up here <laughs> early, and I'll take you and we can scope out some of those uh, spots before we drive down for to, to Washington. To Washington. Hey, let me. Uh... Let me consult with my higher self on that one and chew it over. That's a great idea. I think consult that's an with ins- your wife too. <laughs> that's an inspired <laughs> idea that you got from from while you, while you were uh, listening, while you were chewing on all this stuff. Yeah, I definitely better consult with my wife. <laughs> um, thanks for that invitation. Thanks for having me to Grime America. Yeah, thanks. Buddy. Thanks to everybody who's listened, and thanks for everyone who's interested in these subjects. I think. Uh, I feel they're really important and I really uh, hope, hope that uh, it's beneficial to others. Right on buddy. Yeah. So do we, we'll put all your links in the show notes and everything and uh, yeah, we'll keep in touch. We can't wait to get the book should be here. I, I predict it'll be here tomorrow. <laughs> right on. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Everybody, you know, yeah. Take a picture when you get it. Yeah, we will. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> we'll post it on our social medias and try and sell some books for you. And who knows, you, maybe gentlemen. we'll get you actually in Grimerica Studios this year. That would be awesome. Thank you, Grimericans everywhere. <laughs> okay, Bye. Dave. See you, buddy. Bye-bye. Night. And that was our chat with the fabulous Dave Matheson. Um, yeah, that was good. I didn't think, I think it was, uh, it was good that it wasn't all about the stars. You know, there's some other myths in there. And, and you know, what's weird is I've learned so much about mythology and, and, uh, symbolism since we've had him on. 
Last. We've had him on f- so, four or five times now. Yeah, but We've I mean, but every time budget. I learn, I learn more every time we talk. You know, it's it's good That's between the, the time we talk. Yeah, I was gonna make some comment about you. You mentioned something about. Uh, I was gonna say, well, you are in it now. You're in the esoteric secret the thick organizations. Of it. I'm in the secret yeah, esoteric yeah, yeah. secret sky alien organizations. Actually, we're on summer break. But you. Have- <laughs> <laughs> summer break in July. 5th. We had we had COVID first, so we <laughs> took a break for that, and then we have summer break, and we only meet once a month. So we're like, can't the, you guys engineer us like, out of this thing? We're like, like the, yeah. the laziest guys... faction of Masons in the world. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, thought maybe you'd be able to help us out I think of this thing. At the end of the we'll have end, at the end of the year we'll have ended up meeting like four times this year. What does all your Masons think about the esoteric symbolism of, of, I of masking talk, and I haven't talked to him and, since uh, February. social distancing? <laughs> I haven't talked to him since February. Wow, March? Do we have a March. meeting in March? Yeah, I think it was later than that. March? Maybe it was March. Event. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Everything shut so down. So you don't have Zoom meetings or anything like that? Uh, Why no, don't you they, start up the Zoom? They've meetings been trying again? to get me into the Zoom <laughs> meetings, <laughs> and I'm just like, it. I'm you not doing go. it. Oh. <laughs> so there you go. Don't feel bad when I miss your Zoom stuff or when I'm like. Because it's like, they're like, they, the last one, they were even like, we just like, please like everyone to make an effort. And I was even home, but I'm just like, I know, I know. This is the last hard. thing I'm going to do is like spend three hours on Zoom with you guys. Like, it's just, I'm sorry. You might like it. It might be one of those things you would enjoy it and you'll like it more. I'm sure, but I enjoyed doing other things. Yeah. Other than sitting in front of a computer. Yeah. Well, like if it's out and going out and sitting around with people, you know, that's more. Yeah. But I'm not into the meeting over Zoom thing. You know, like. I've been meeting people over Zoom for like the better part of a decade now, like crazy. And I mean, you know, yeah. I don't want to do it in my spare time too. Unless, uh, I mean, if I was actually locked in my house or in some sort of lockdown that I couldn't just subvert. I have to run a Zoom meeting tomorrow with a meditation and everything. Yeah, I mean, you're a Zoom guy. I mean, they should, between your Dungeons and Dragons and your recovery, recovery meetings and your <laughs> podcasting, you just like... <laughs> You live on Zoom most of the time. Yeah. Well, big thanks to uh, our buddy Dave Matheson for coming on the show again, sending us a book, being a wonderful human being. Of course, Dave is a good friend of mine. I'm texting with Dave at least on a weekly basis, if not more. Um, Bit of a mentor to me. And, uh, yeah, just a fabulous cat. Of course, maybe we will definitely see him twice this year, maybe even three times. Maybe we'll sneak him into the studio. Take him out to the bush, show him some mountains and shit, show him a little camp out, uh, maybe do some sea setting. C5. What's the difference? I, we told branding. We about this. Branding. Yeah. Branding. Well, we need some Grimerica branded C5. <laughs> I don't know. No, it's okay. GE5. We're not really doing it much, so. Gram we'll encounters. <laughs> Guaranteed to encounter Gram. Close encounter. If you pay extra, you can have a close encounter with Gram. That costs extra. Now I'm an overnighter. It's even more. Uh, actually, there is. Uh, get in touch with me if you want to go to the Dave Matheson event because uh, there's some moving parts right now. I can't guarantee you there's some stuff left. As of right now, I think there is. By the time this comes out, there might not be. But there is some moving parts with COVID and the reschedule. Some people are you know, maybe trying to resell or can't make it with the new dates. I've got to take a close look at it, but there might be a spot or two left. So shoot me an email, com, and I'll let you know where you fit there. Uh, you can definitely squeeze, try and get in on the second week of Randall Carlson there. Dave Matheson won't be at the second week, but uh, I think Brandon Powell will end up being at the second week. Uh, shoot me an email there too, com. Actually, I think you can actually just buy tickets for that one at, uh, at contact at com slash Carlson. Uh, check out the show notes. Do all the stuff in there that we ask you to. There's a honey dooby dooby do list that would be just fucking fabulous if you could do it. And uh, I don't know if you guys are getting a little value from the podcast. We think you are. I uh, like to think you are. There's at least a few hundred of you that are getting some value from the podcast and sending a little value back our way over at America.ca slash support. I think this will be like episode 430 something. So. I don't know. You got 430 some podcasts are all like an hour too long. What kind of value does that add to your life? Is it better than your cable? Is it worse than your cable? Maybe, I don't know. We don't know where it fits. Is it better than your morning coffee? I don't know. 
America.ca slash support. You decide what value the podcast adds to your life. Throw a little value back our way. I mean, we are kind of just sort of looking at the at the writing on the wall, and it seems to be just a matter of time until we get canceled from some of these platforms. So we are in the background trying to set up all of our own infrastructure, uh, working on some Mastodon stuff. We're working with uh, some of the guys over at the Union of the Unwanted and OBDM to try and get some stuff going in the background so that we are cancel-proof, trying to make that happen. Or America.ca slash support. We can't uh, do any of that sort of stuff without uh, supporters like you. We love you. Sign up today. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Started writing down a list of things to do. Number one on the list of things to do was to write a list of things to do. Number two on the list, a little more nihilist, wrote down the cake is a lie. There is no spoon. Johnny flipped out, they put him in a rubber room. Hide all your money under your mattress. You call your enemy a fascist. Somebody call an ambulance, the sky is falling. Hide all your money under your mattress. You call your enemy a fascist. Somebody call an ambulance, the sky is falling. Started to carve my initials into a 150 foot tree. Forgot who I was, where I was, cut my hand and it began to bleed. Was only looking to leave my mark in the bark in the park. Now I'm in agony. I have no name. My legacy is written in the sparks in your brain. Hide all your money under your mattress. You call your enemy a fascist. Somebody call an ambulance. The sky is falling. Hide all your money under your mattress. You call your enemy a fascist. Somebody call an ambulance. The sky is falling. Johnny crumpled up, threw away his list of things to do. Instead he got to jotting down his life, blood legacy, manifesto, manifesto. Live by principles of peace, mix it with charity. Don't leave the next generation a world of scarcity. Johnny wasn't a commie, he was my fellow man. Johnny wasn't a commie, he was my fellow man. Johnny wasn't a Nazi, he was a firebrand. Johnny wasn't a Nazi, he was a firebrand. Somebody call an ambulance, the sky.